Hi, Maureen, and welcome everybody today. Thanks for coming in, and I'm going to invite uh, Councillor James Daniels to open the meeting with a karakia. Hi, uh, ka, ka tua hau, uh, te mea tuatahi uh, e a mate o te motu uh, haere, haere, haere atu rā uh, me uh, ki a koe fil mō tō mate tō pāpa, kā roha ki a koe ki me tō whānau. Uh, just acknowledging those who have passed recently and uh, for Councillor Major, the passing of his father recently too. So uh, our karakia, the karakia today is going to call on the energy, the experiences, the expertise in this room, in the city, for all the uh, mahi we're about to uh, carry out in the next few hours. So, uh, nō reira, uh, tū taua mai runga, tū taua mai raro, tū taua mai waho, tū taua mai roto. Kia tau ai te Māori tū, te Māori ora, ki te katoa, a hau mea hui e tai e. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you, James, and it's always nice to, to start off on that even footing. We're all here to get the best outcome can for the city. Up, yeah, I can. Is that better? Thank you. You're welcome. It's nice to start off with the karakia and recognise that we're all here for the best outcome of this meeting and the best outcome for our city and our people in it. So welcome everybody here today. Um, I'd like to call for any declarations of interest on any of the items in the agenda. If anyone has anything, speak up or during the meeting. And um, I think what we'll do now, there's no declarations of interest. We will move to the uh, deputations by appointment. Uh, noting today that we have six written deputations that have been sent in. And oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to put the apology for Jake McClellan. Can someone move that apology? Tim, seconded Dan. all those in favour say aye. Aye. Opposed, that's carried. Um, so the um, deputations by appointment today, we have six written deputations. They've been sent in. The members around the table have assured me that they have all read these submissions. And please note that they'll be attached to the minutes of this meeting. We have five verbal submissions, ten minutes each. And first of all, I'd like to welcome to the table Bruce King, and all the uh, deputations are on item 9, the options for the organics processing plant. Welcome Bruce. My name is Bruce King and I'm a resident in Seascape Gardens, which is in the direct wind shadow of the organics processing plant during the predominant northeast winds. And there is no other odour producing industry between our property and the OPP. Firstly, I wish to acknowledge the help and support of Yoni Johansson has given to our community over the years. I also appreciate that the Christchurch City Council has finally admitted that the OPP creates a pollution problem in the surrounding suburbs. My extensive research shows that the composting plants are a major producers of greenhouse gases and is a result create an environmental and public health hazard. Since its inception, the plant has been ruining the lives of people living in its wind shadow by, one, producing vile odours that make it impossible for people to enjoy their outdoor activities on their properties on an average of at least three times a week. Producing, two, producing black dust, pathogens and mould. These are natural byproducts of the composting process and are released into the air we breathe, affecting everyone and more so the elderly, infirm and the very young. The dust from compost is a well-known and recognised source of the Legionnaire's pathogen. Three, being a major producer of greenhouse gases, both CO2 and methane. The CCC was given three months to eliminate the OPP's foul and sickening odours. Unfortunately, and disappointingly so, this did not happen. In fact, in the following months, we've had to endure far more intense and prolonged periods of odour. The three waters and wastes preferred solution to the problem would require residents in the infected suburbs to put up with the odour for at least another two years, more likely four to five years, with no guarantee the problem being eliminated. Increasing the tunnel size and the time the compost is in, in the ovens will never be an appropriate solution to the odours or reduction of the greenhouse gases. 
Until a new plant is built in a, re in a rural area, meat and dairy waste should be forbidden from inclusion in the green bins and dumped, along with the waste of meat processing plants and shopping malls that is currently going through the OPP. Spending more ratepayers' money on a totally inappropriate on the totally inappropriate present site is not financially wise, as proposed solutions will not reduce odour or greenhouse gas emissions. The windrows will still produce odour, black dust, pathogens and mould, thereby in contributing to be not a, continuing to be not only a public nuisance but more importantly a public health hazard. The only feasible financial and permanent solution is to relocate the plant into a rural area at least five kilometres away from any, any residential zone. While researching composting plants around the world, a plant called the Wood Lawn MBT Facility, located in New South Wales, is a great example of a modern composting plant. This plant is really the state of the art, unlike the current OPP in Metro Place. To quote Helen Beaumont, Head of Three Waters and Waste, we want to be, a, be good neighbours. So CCC, be good neighbours and shut the OPP now and start rebuilding in a more appropriate site and eco-friendly manner. Personally, after nearly 12 years of living and breathing the toxic dust and vile odour, it's 12 years too many. Over this period, both my wife and I have experienced deterioration in our respiratory health. I have made presentations to this council and local community board to the previous CEO and also the current CEO, I have spent way too much of my time trying to effect positive change for the benefit of our community, only to have this problem ignored. Shame on the council that it was not concerned for the residents' welfare that brought us to this point, but a threat of fines and shutdown. More information is required before any decision can be made and more time for the community to question this plan. Two working days to prepare a presentation to this, this committee is totally inadequate time to do any research of what's in the, in the presented and there is just totally no time for a, a proper presentation to present. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Bruce? Sam? Just a really quick one, Sam, thank you Bruce for coming in and expressing your frustration and I do note your last point about the time to prepare. Do you have a view on the staff recommendation? I think it's totally inappropriate. It's been, it's been convinced to use the, the site that's already there and it's, it's not going to reduce the odour that's coming out because it's the, it says increasing the size of the um, biofilter. The biofilter is uh, totally inadequate for taking out the odour and that comes out of the tunnels. And if you look at any of the plumes that you have in, on our uh, council file, you'll find that the major concentration of odour is actually coming through the biofilter. Right. Thank you. Yanni? So, um, thank you for the deputation. I, I hear you that it's been an ongoing issue and you want something done about it. Do you think, um, given that you've asked for more time, laying this on the table and then seeking community views on the proposed options within the next few weeks and then making a decision before the end of the year would be, a, be an approach that would be satisfactory? I think it would be more satisfactory than having two working days to work out some answers and, and, and work out some uh, deputation here, which is 10 minutes is not long enough to answer all the, ask all the questions that I'd like to ask about the, the plant. And can I ask you, has, has anyone from council staff or the organisation asked you on your view on what option that should be gone with? No, we've had no contact from the staff of the Living Earth or the City Council on what would be the best option. We have discussed it with David and Helen, but we've had no real input to what can be done because we knew, didn't know what the options were going to be and this plan was not presented to us you. before we had those discussions yeah. with them. And did you participate in the residence survey? Yes, but, I did. Yeah, and have you had any report back on the results of that? I just got the results yesterday online. Okay. And I'm, um, yeah. Thanks. So you have actually had engagement with the staff through Helen Beaumont and Dave Adamson? Yes. That's good. And if you, if I may ask a question, if you uh, were confident that this option was going to remediate and mitigate and reduce or eliminate the odour, would you be supporting this today? No. 
the reason why I say no is because there's still going to be windrows, there's still going to be turning and dust distributed around the place, which is, 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 is a toxic form of dust and pathogens that cause diseases. So you still think that um, even though the windrows are going to be reduced from 30,000 square metres to 2,000, that that level will still be unacceptable to you? Yes, it would be, because we are in the direct wind shadow of that plant. So if the um, other option two was accelerated to cover those windrows earlier, would you then support the option? No, it's in a totally inappropriate place. It's because of the location? Because of the location. Right. It's only there because the drainage board owned the land. Yeah, thank you. Are there any other questions for Bruce? No. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, just a question. Have we got, um, we've got headsets for people that are hard of hearing. Oh, oh sorry, no, it's okay. Well done, Has he been offered? Yeah, okay. Thank you. All right. So now I'll call up um, Alan King. Is Alan here? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Welcome, Alan. Good morning. Good morning. So my name is Ellen King, and I firstly want to say that I really do not want to be here today, but I was compelled when I was reminded of the old, wise old saying that says, for evil to prosper in this world, it only takes good men to stand by and do nothing. And so that's why I'm here, because I consider this plant an evil in our community. I have lived in Seascape Gardens, which is just under one kilometre from the OPP, for 19 years, <clears throat> and lived happily in our almost new house for the first eight years. We enjoyed the benefits of the location, a bus stop around the corner, five to seven minutes drive to South Brighton Beach, and the estuary walks, three supermarkets in close range, and great neighbours. In fact, the only thing missing in those days was the horrific odour that was then forced upon us after the OPP commenced operation. The green waste was already being accepted on the Metro Place site at the time and caused no problems to the neighbourhood. Our fears were allayed somewhat when the resource consent stated that there was to be no offensive odour or dust omitted from the boundary of the property. However, breaches of this clause occurred almost immediately. This morning, I really want to emphasise the effect on our lives of having to, affect, of having to live with the putrid odours for almost 12 years. My aim is to get you all to be able to imagine what the breach of the consent feels like for us. Unless you have lived beside a piggery or poultry farm, I know it is very hard to imagine what a really bad constant smell is like when it is present in the air for hours on end as this does not happen in normal everyday residential life. So I would like to go to another one of our senses to put it into perspective. Please imagine, get your thought process going, shut your eyes if you have to. Imagine you have the neighbours from hell. They have three boisterous sons, just a couple of years apart, the youngest, Johnny, he's about 10. Now, Johnny has had a major growth spurt and developed a passion for basketball. Now, Mike, about 12, loves his tennis. George, aged 14, he's not sporty at all, but loves his music and plays drums in the high school band. Now it's summertime, great weather for eating and entertaining outdoors. Problem is, Johnny is continually bouncing the basketball on the concrete drive and shooting hoops with all the associated noise that goes with his activity. <coughs> Mike's dad, he painted him a volleyboard 
on the concrete block wall of the garage. So he's busy practicing his serves and his volleys with great gusto. At the same time, George is in the garage banging away on the drums, playing Wipeout over and over again. Got the picture? And hopefully, hopefully you have all the sounds playing in your head as well. Now imagine this going on for hours on end, and then they go inside for dinner, and you think, thank God for that. However, half an hour later, it all starts up again, and by now, you are starting to get really annoyed. You know you are going to have to resort to those noise-cancelling headphones for the rest of the evening. Can you imagine this happening three days a week, every week of the year, no matter what season? Of course you can't, because in real life this would never happen. Not for one year, let alone for 12 years. So I hope you are beginning to understand how frustrated, traumatised, angry and victimised many residents in the wind shadow of the OPP are feeling. There is no odour cancelling device available to us. And stopping breathing, either through our nose or our mouth, is not an option. The trauma of the situation we are in goes well beyond the foul odours. It extends to the reinforcement of the fact that if you live in the East, you are considered second-class citizens and really should not expect to be treated with the privileges we might experience if we lived on the other side of town. If it were not so, this plant would have been shifted years ago and would have initiated an end to this geographical and socio-economic discrimination. We have complained about the continual breach of the consent by the OPP for 12 years, with favour and protection being given to the private owner-operator with no regard for the welfare of the local businesses or residents. I am really tired of being a victim in this situation. Any abusive situation has to come to an end before a victim of any trauma or crime can move on. I do not want to feel anxious every time I open a door to the outside, wondering if I'm going to be accosted by the foul odour yet again, and then feeling the rush of adrenaline as my body goes into fight mode. This power game and prejudice towards residents in the East has to end, and the realisation that this is a matter of proper infrastructure, just like flooding, and has to be addressed. Please do not make a rash, uninformed decision that gives us more of the same past dreadful years or spend ratepayer money on a solution that will always prevent you meeting your carbon emission targets and leading to further expenditure in the future. Will this council be remembered as the brave and innovative group that set the ecologically safe and sound template for composting in New Zealand, knowing you made the right long-term financial decision or will you settle for the option that is being pushed by Three Waters and Waste, as, being, as presented in the agenda, as the easiest and cheapest solution without fully investigating the option of relocating the plant well away from residential areas? This option will save ratepayers millions in the long term. Thank you. Thank you very much. I certainly had pictures from your description. I think it was a very novel way to produce that. Are there any questions for Alan <coughs> around the table? No questions. So, Alan, your option, your preferred option, is to move it. Yes, I think it's, it is the only option. And your certainly. Uh, 
Um, that going by the recommendation before the plant was actually built, um, we have on record that uh, it was stated to the council that it should not have been built in that locality, but it did go ahead against uh, all advice. But you're also finding it absolutely intolerable to live with the, the odour oh, on an look, ongoing basis. Honestly, it, it is, it is, everything I've said there is true. That you go out the door, you're wondering if there's going to be a smell. When there's no smell, oh, that's great. You go out, whether you go out for a drive, you come back, you open the car windows to put it in the garage, and you, you, it's just there. Yeah. And I put in um, the latest, I think, uh, last week, I put in a report at midnight after I let the dog out and had it come blasting through my front door. So midnight, you know, it's still going. We haven't opened our east-facing... In fact, we don't open any windows except the toilet window. And that, let's face it, we all have to open the toilet window at some stage. Now, I can tell you, and I was going to bring you in a duster to show you, that the black dust that ten tunnels down between our um, garage and the house comes in through the toilet window, and even after vacuuming, it comes in, it settles on the right-hand side of my toilet, where no footprints go, no, it's right up there against the wall. After vacuuming, I can wash my tiles down and I can gather up a black mass on my duster. That's after vacuuming. Not so much on the left side. Now, what does that say to me? It's coming in that side of the window, which is, guess what, in line with the plant, comes in and must hit the wall and settle on the floor. Mm. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Okay. Thank, thanks again for making the effort to come in. Thanks. All right. I'd like to invite Geoffrey King. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And perhaps we have tried, I have tried, sent emails, um, rung up, spoken to, to get meetings with some of you people sitting around this table, but we get fobbed off all the time. Andrew Turner, election 217, put it in writing. We couldn't make an appointment to come and see you, to talk to you, to tell you what we're putting up with. Some of you have been here seven or eight years around this council or some form of table, and you've done nothing to help us. And one, Sarah Templeton. Uh, sorry, Geoffrey King, I'm going to the, ask you to on. stop personalising no, no, this, this, please. This is our free right to speak. No. And I, I'm mentioning names. No, I don't want you to personalise. Three people. quarters of your people Pardon? and your constituents do are affected by this. Now, we've had this odour. For 11.7 years, it's debilitating. The black dust, the foul odour. The odour is that bad that sometimes in the summer we go down, we, don't, we have a two storied house, we go down and sleep down on the floor and one on the couch. Or we get in our car and go down to the beach and sleep in the car. That's how bad it is. And this is what you are doing to us by not complying with the documents. We in the northeast wind shadow are always sweeping up the black dust. And it's so bad that it sticks to newly painted roofs. I had my roof painted last year. It was water blasted down four o'clock in the evening. They painted it at eight o'clock the next morning, and it's like sandpaper. One guy had to have his roof replaced. It was cheaper to replace the roof because he had composting dust as big as your fingernail stuck to it. We breathe in the toxic dust, the foul odour, that contain the viruses, the pathogens, the bioaerosols, as Bruce mentioned, goes into our bodies and into our organs. You are slowly killing us. Council in action over this 
problem 11.7 years to date. You are slowly killing us, as I said, and it's not humane to be living like this. Those of us in our retirement should be enjoying our twilight years, but our time is consumed fighting the malfeasance or is it misfeasance from those associated with the City Council? Even our representatives, some of our representatives sitting around the table. And I have to say, I thank Yanni Johansson for all the hard work, as Bruce has said, that he has put in to trying to get this fixed for us. But he's battling. He's battling all you people around here who take no notice of him. We can't even approach and sit down, as I've explained. You either do not answer our emails, or you say, put it in writing. Every rule in the book is broken. The foundation document. None of you have read it. None of you have, I know. Because otherwise you would have got something done about it. Contract number 0607. Dash 192 has never been adhered to since 2009 when the plant opened. Even the head of Three Waters and Waste, Helen Beaumont, had never heard, let alone read the document, three months ago when we met her along with the general manager, David Adamson. The head of the department running the outfit has no idea of what is required. It breaches the WorkSafe Act. The New Zealand WorkSafe New Zealand 213 Act clauses 42F, 43.2D and 47. The council is not above the law. A complaint made to the WorkSafe in 215, they in turn wrote three letters to this council, which were totally ignored. And I believe Mr Dennis McCracken from headquarters in Auckland, that's where it went work so far, when he said, Geoffrey, they just do not respond. And I wonder why they do not respond. It would be interesting to find out. Malfeasance again. This place is not above the law. You are here to protect the people that live in it. It breaches the resource... Management Act, 1991, mainly an ECAN responsibility, but the CCC is not above the law. It breaches the 215 Becker report, commissioned by Carleen Edwards, at a cost, a cost of around about $70,000. And this council needs to read and understand what the re engineers have put, people that are more qualified than you. Put it in the middle of a 400 hectare farm. I'm going to suggest it goes to a valley on the way to Akaroa. Buy a valley, put it up there where the winds don't take the dust and the smell everywhere. It breaches the Regional Council consents of 2008 and again in 2011. It breaches the Ministry for the Environment's Good Practice Guide for Assessing the Management Odour. It breaches the Becker CHZM Technical Evaluation Report written out for the sole purpose um, for when they built this plant, and that was back in, 90, in 2007. It breaches the 2010 Environmental Management Plan, and none of you would have read that. You wouldn't have a clue what's in it. And you sit round this table and make decisions. The two, the two fifteen A Valen, uh, Ecan Valen Barrett survey. You've ignored it. You've rubbished it. There's no proper biofilter. There's only one biofilter over, <coughs> over the manufacturing chambers. It's just a tray with bark in it. The odour is not put through a water bath system. And now they're going to say in the report that they're going to do, they're going to push through air. It's rubbish. You've got people running this outfit that know nothing about it. 
We aren't engineers. We know nothing about it. We've researched it. We've had 11.7 years to research it, and you've done nothing. <coughs> the Windrose lie, <coughs> oh, sorry. Um, then there's the $340,000 this council spent on an odour plume technology. No longer available. And ask yourself why. Because it exposes the problem, doesn't it? The part, last printout we received had all the surrounding streets and buildings removed. They were redacted. So we could not say, oh, look, it's over the boundary. It's a disgrace the way this place is run with this um, three waters and waste. The lies, deceit, deception, abuse and bullying of the community have received over the years from the staff of Three Waters and Waste is unacceptable behaviour, especially from growing adults and especially from <clears throat> when it affects people's lives, lifestyles and health. Um, the CCC abuse um, and it con contravenes the consents to this community forum. Now today, the report before you, the Wastewater Department, and Department are offering more of the same. This report is the same that was floated in 2015-16. I was at a, uh, a cultural function and I asked Councillor Shen, how is progress going with fixing the OPP? Oh, we're working on it. The Mayor even said at the meeting, we're going to fix it five years ago. Councillor Raf Manji, I asked him at another cultural event in, in Fendleton, he said, put it in writing. You can't sit down around with you people personally and speak and tell you what's happening, where the law is being broken. It's disgusting. Go ahead. Today's... Um, it's still... Whatever you do, it still does not abide by Clause 3.9. One, two, three, four, five. And that is the basic clause in the foundation document which clearly states that everything has to be under negative pressure. That means everything has, be, has to be covered. The windrows, the lot. Yeah. And people have sat round this table, haven't they? Yes, look the other way. Have sat round this table for seven or eight years knowing about this and done nothing about it. It is not good enough. Go ahead and accept the report, but I tell you what, there'll be a parade of lawyers beating a track to this place. Even before the plant was built, experts in the composting industry, Trans-Pacific Australia, stated that 40 Metro Place site was not appropriate, too close to the residential zones and even the manufacturing zones. People's health. Now, oh, Geoffrey, your 10 minutes is up, so if you could just well, too bad. wrap up, please. Buy a valley on route to Akaroa and shove it up there. We've put up an 11.7 year and you're quibbling over a few seconds over 10 minutes, and we've put up with 11.7 years of this crap. Yep. Thank you, Geoffrey. Good submission. Thank you for coming in. And we are, we are listening. I'd like to invite now um, Michael Williams. Sorry. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good morning, all. Good morning. Um, and thanks very much for the opportunity to make a presentation on the ongoing odour concerns affecting the Bromley residents. Uh, my name is Michael Williams. I'm retired from Kiwi Rail as a locomotive engineer. And for the last eight years of my career, I was an elected union rep for the RMTU, ending up as the South Island Rail Rep for about six years, sitting at the senior table of the management table. 
Now, one thing unionism has taught, my experience in unionism has taught me, it's shown me when there's a moral injustice or a social injustice, and that as, as a person who's been brought and bred up on unionism, I can't stand by and just ignore what's going on in my new community. Now, I, I, my, my submission is going to be quite different because I've, I've lived in the area only for six months and I've only been involved in this group for three days. So, I mean, I don't have this wealth of detail and information that these long-term residents have. But I've, I've certainly have been exposed to the odours and the ongoing issues. In a way, I'm your eyes and ears as an observer of what's going on in the area. So I bring perhaps a, a fresh perspective. I'd like to start off this discussion around, around one word, and that word is freedom. And certainly freedom's been a word that's been in our minds a lot lately with COVID-19 and restrictions that have been placed on our life. So we're all quite conscious of it. And I looked up, what, what does freedom mean? Freedom comes in many forms, but at its heart is the opportunity to speak, act and pursue happiness without unnecessary external restrictions. And I'd just like to repeat that last bit, without unnecessary external restrictions. Well, I think that's extremely important. Freedom to breathe air that is uncontaminated is the most basic of human rights. To have, to have confidence that the air you breathe does not contain chemicals, pollutants or odours that may adversely affect your physical and mental well-being is simply a God-given right. This is, this is a God-given right. Freedom to plan a barbecue without the dreaded composting smell coming as an uninvited guest and destroying the ambience of a summer's evening. I mean, I'm sitting there thinking in my own head, do I invite my family around tonight? What's the prevailing wind? It's embarrassing, yeah, yeah. and it's also, it's also off-putting. You know, it's restricting our ability to live, to live our lives fully. Yeah. Freedom, freedom to relax with a cold beer in your own backyard on a hot summer's day. What could be a more fundamental and basic freedom and human right? We've cut the lawns, we've sat down, we've got a beer in front of us, probably a corona, and we're sitting back just breathing in the fresh smell of mowing grass and really enjoying it, and then whammo, you know, it's all gone, it's lost. Yeah. Yeah. In the current situation, we're often captives. This is the other end of freedom, people, captives. Yeah. At times, prisoners in our own homes, with doors and windows closed to mitigate the stench from our neighbourly composting plant. It's not freedom. Now, I've been a Bromley resident for around six months, and during this time have experienced firsthand the ongoing concerns that plague the suburb. This led me to attend Sunday's community meeting and gave me considerable insight into the significant impact this issue has on the ongoing physical and mental well-being of the residents. I came away from this meeting with some really serious concerns. I think what really hit me was concerns raged around major respiratory issues that may be caused by particulate matter. And, and just a reminder what particulates are, I'm sure everybody here understands, but I think it's important to state it. Particulates are microscopic particles of solid or liquid matter that are suspended in the air. Now, composting particulates are of a particular concern. We all know about Legionnaire's disease. We've all seen the warnings, repeated warnings. Put your mask on, cut your bag, be in a well-ventilated space, you, you know, damp it down if you can, take precautions. And yet, I, dur during my time in the Royal Maritime Trade Union, we did a lot of testing, particularly in the Atera Tunnel, measuring particulates. This is a compulated process requiring very finely calibrated equipment. <coughs> and I'm wondering what's actually been done in this area to measure these particulates and to understand what the health risk is that we may be exposed to. The, the other issue for me was the short window of time to assimilate the significant detail of information around the various options set out in the Organics Processing Plan, Development Options Plan, and the level of technical expertise required to be able to make an informed decision around how best to resolve this issue. My view is that the decision made by the Council needs to be deferred until such time as a planning engineer can present to us, in layman's language, preferably using the dreaded PowerPoint presentation, how these proposed changes will work. We're not technical people. We, you know, I've looked through the start, I don't really understand what it means. You know, we need to have somebody come along to a community group, a, a working Bromley community group, and actually present to us what's going on, what the impact is, how these decisions are going to be validated, um, you know, for research that's gone behind them. 
I'd also, I'd also like consideration to be given for a residence group to, to a, a residence group to visit the site to increase our understanding of the current, current operation. I mean, we talk about things like windrows and tunnels, and I've, you know, I've got a picture in my mind, but that might be completely inaccurate. I, we simply don't know. You've noticed I've referred to a residence group. We are going to set up a residence community group and, and work in a structured process. We want, a resident, we want the residents involved, a working party, Bromley Air Reform Group, and then a liaison group with the council that works back through the process. I mean, this is fundamental ways of, of communication and negotiation. And, and this is, I believe, the only way we can start to reach an outcome that we all agree with, yeah, is yeah. by involvement. What also stood out for, for me at the meeting was the total frustration at how this issue has been allowed to drift on for so long. Recent air quality observations now has us to a point clearly identifying what we all understood, that composting at an industrial scale combined with the current location and prevailing nor'easterly wind will direct this odour into the heart of Bromley. Look, you only had to drive down Dyer's Road on a nice warm summer's day, going wherever you're going, and, and not even wind your windows down and smell the stench coming from the compost plant. It's been obvious to everybody for years, and yet there's been a total, almost like a total denial of this is what's causing the composting problem. You know, you live in an industrial area, the article in the press, which I couldn't believe, suck it up. I mean, it, it's gone on for too long. We as residents only want what Greater Christchurch takes for granted. That is the right to enjoy our homes and backyards free from this pollution plague, that descends not only into our residences, but also our hearts and souls. This becomes the arbitrator of our daily quality of life. The community now wants action from the council. We do not want more tinkering at the edges over the next two to three years with an uncertain outcome. We no longer accept the continuing mismanagement of this site. From location to resolving odour issues and denial of concerns are all finished. The ball is very much with the council to do what is right for the community, to be a good neighbour and take immediate steps to give relief to the Bromley community. It's like my fine companions here have said. I mean, they've been fighting this for 10, 11 years. It's been ongoing for them. What we want is our quality of life back, to work with representatives of the Bromley community and to develop an outcome that ensures clean, safe and odour-free air for the community. Thanks very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Michael. That's an excellent submission. I think we have time for a couple of questions, if okay. you'd like, uh, James, and then Leanne. Kia ora, Michael. Leanne. Um, yeah, thanks for your submission and your uh, background. Were you aware of the odour before you moved to Bromley? Yes, I was. Like I've, I've, I've lived in Wattle Drive. I've lived in Pine Ave. I've lived in Rocking Horse Road. And... And I've, as I said, recently moved into Bromley. I don't think um, odour should be a consideration on what the suburb, whether I live in the suburb or not. It's my partner's house, but we're in a prime. To me, it's a prime residential spot. We've got fantastic amenities, supermarkets. We're in the hub. We've got a short ten-minute drive to Sumner. We've got Brighton Beach. We're straight down the road. We're virtually here. You know, it's, it's an excellent location. And, and, you know, we've got a really nice house and we love gardening, we're passionate about gardening and, and you know, we want to stay in the area. But I do believe that, that I shouldn't have to make a decision based on, uh, you know, the odour, but I didn't realise the extent of a problem. Mm. I didn't realise how long it had been ongoing. Great, thank you. OK, thank you. Leanne? Part, part of the issue that's been raised with us is the, um, th there were two identified sources. One was the eco-central um, site itself, which has uh, subsequently been um, uh, resolved. Uh, so now the focus is very much on that, but that's not the only source. So you, you will understand that no matter what we do, um, it, there will be other sources of, um, of no, odour. No, no, okay. no. Okay. Right. You. you need to wake up. I was so, asking for the gentleman at the end of the please? table. I thought that he had been very reasonable in the way that he had presented, and I just... I'm, I'm new to the area, and I yeah. understand it's an industrial area, yeah. and there may be some other minor odour concerns. The primary, the principal odour, is the composting operation. Right. That directly 
directly directs its, its odour, our neighbourly compostation, that directs its odour directly down onto the heart of our suburbs. I have seen schematics shown to me with, with diagrammatic form where that odour out of the funnel via lands in the community. Mm. And we're direct, a significant part of the community is in a direct path to it. And I honestly believe from my heart that once this problem is sorted out, that, that we'll be able to live our lives in a manner the same as everyone else can. And you know, have, you, but, have you experienced the same dust issue that we've heard from other neighbours? I don't do the dust thing. <laughs> <laughs> Shame on you. <laughs> Yes to that because I'm only opposite, basically, I'm in Winwood Lane, which is opposite Seascape Gardens. So, so you're saying yes to that. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I would say yes to the dusting. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Uh, Michael, thank you for um, You're welcome, and thanks, thanks very much for the opportunity. Yeah, no. and, and look, I, I really Hang do on, hope Michael. That um, Anne's got a I've question, question for you. Yeah, just one. You, you, you're talking about the residence group, which is a fantastic idea. Yep. And you've talked about the need to... Um, have opportunities to visit uh, yep. the site and to get some the technical information yep. from staff and to talk with them. Are there any other thoughts about what could be helpful in building that collaborative approach? Well, we've well, even got a name for the group, so, Bromley Air Reform Management Group. Right. Because um, um, what I've noticed is a total lack of structure and with the bulk of the residents, and, and we've got some really fine residents here who have, have spent, devoted their lives to this course, literally. But we need structure. And I, and I think by us establishing a working group that can report back to the residents and that engages with the council and we, we, we can review on a regular basis um, any improvements or fine tuning or proposals. And reach, it's always, life is always about compromise, about finding the middle ground to a solution and, and making improvements. I mean, I, I think the biggest thing that I would want is a really strong commitment from the council that yes, we recognise this problem Order. and yes, we are truly committed to, uh, to, to doing something around that's going to work and constructively remove this odour issue. That's right. And thank you. And I think I like the way you said something about a middle ground, something that's going to actually appease the problem, but you're not going straight to a solution. You just want it solved. I want it solved, yes. Yeah. Thank yes. you. And, and I want to work... I want the council to work with us here. Yeah, and council wants to yeah. work with you yeah. too. Thank you very much, Michael. That's excellent. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Madam Chair. Now welcome Good Alexandra night. Davids to come and speak to us. <coughs> Our final submission. Madam Alex's. Chair, just before we start the next thing, can I have a point of order, please? No, not from the gallery. Alex, Madam? can you? Not from the gallery, no. We'll get there. Welcome, Alex. Suppression, suppression, suppression. Uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, your email. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm here today to speak to the board's involvement in the Bromley odour issues. Uh, the board have not had the opportunity to meet to discuss the report on the committee's agenda, so we are unable to give a board view on this today. As board members, there have been a number of us that have been attending the liaison group meetings for as long as we've been elected, um, and that is over seven years now for most of us. There is a clear ongoing issue with odours, and it is unfortunate that we have struggled in the past to get action to improve it, as ECAN hadn't been identifying it as a problem. Now that they have, it is a relief to see council both trialling new methods and planning for capital spending to mitigate the odours. While we recognise that there are other odours in the area, it is clear that most are from the organics processing plant, that being 70% of the odours. The community meeting held on Sunday was useful for the community members that attended to be more informed, even though it was held with very short notice. It is clear the community are frustrated. They want both action on the odour and to be better informed. I would like to request more significant engagement and a technical workshop where the new plan can be explained clearly with expected outcomes for this community. The well-being and quality of life of our residents is our priority. Now, this is a great catchphrase, and I would love to see it used to its most full meaning and capacity for this community. 
This community have not had normal day-to-day -day living situations of which you have all heard today. And as citizens, we should all have the right to breathe freely. <clears throat> just want to say thank you so much to you all for your time today and your consideration for helping make true positive change for this immensely affected community. Thank you, Alex, and thanks for those very helpful comments, mm. recognising that we're here today to find a way forward and not a way back. And I know the pain of the past is, is big, but we're here today to find a way through this because we really are listening to the residents, and you're quite right, they should not have had to be putting up with this for so long. Um, are there any questions for Alex from any of the members? Aaron. Yeah, Alex, do you believe the board would, on this particular dis decision, prefer to have a position before the council makes a decision? I would, um, I can't speak for the board right now, but um, I think that it would have been useful um, for us to be more informed prior to today's decision. It does feel rather rushed. Thanks, Aaron. Yanni and then James. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for the deputation. Do you think the council should engage and seek the views of residents as to what options are being considered before we make a decision? I think um, that's obviously what the community are asking for. Thank you. James? Sam? One quick one. Thanks, Alex. And obviously, Run that's come in and made a deputation so far. Do you have a particular view on? Because I guess the conundrum we have is whether we um, do something now, you know, and, and look at getting this based on the, the technical advice and accept the, the points people have made around that, yep. or potentially, um, if we were to move it, delaying this even further and having the residents. Do, do you have a view on that sort of? the preferred approach? Do we want to get it sorted personally? now or, or keep fighting? <laughs> Look, yeah. personally, this community wants, like my view on what's been happening for ages, um, the community wants action <clears throat> and they want it now. Yep. But we also need to go through <clears throat> the process of, uh, it just feels so rushed um, and I don't feel that everybody is fully informed around all of the issues and the processes that are happening going forward. Um, so, look, whilst we want action now, we don't want to delay the process either. So good luck to you all making your decisions today because it's not easy, I know. But, um, yeah, I think there is a strong push from the community to actually understand fully what um, the implications of today's paper is all about. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? No. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Appreciate you coming in. Thank you. Thank you, everybody else, for coming in. I know it takes effort and time to come in and speak to us, but it's really worthwhile. And also thank the people who've written in these submissions. They have been read, and we've digested those and adding those to the decision-making, because we're sitting here reading the submissions and are the decision-maker. Um, I'm not doing the item now. I've got to do the minutes first. No, I just wanted to raise that procedural motion, and I wanted to move um, a resolution to suspend standing orders so that the written submissions who have asked to be read out can be read out. Standing orders to do that. Does that require a vote? Two, there's two issues there that I think, two questions I want to ask of staff is 
do they believe that this is a rush decision? And secondly, do they believe, do they feel that the community is not informed about these issues? If, whatever, depending on what they say, um, this is such a big deal. Okay, so the advice we've had is it's not a, a matter that's covered by standing orders, but you can move a motion to that. If you want them read out, you can move that and we'll decide at the meeting. So we've had a number of submitters that actually did go to the trouble of writing deputations that they specifically asked be read out at the meeting. I'd like to move that that happens. Is there a seconder? Tim? Can you speak up, please? I'll put that motion. All those in favour of the sub written submissions being read out, please raise your hand. Oh, she needs to speak. Yeah, I do. Mm. Oh, God. Three, four, five, six, seven. Against? <coughs> there would be no time. No, nothing, nothing, nothing. Um, nothing be lost. No, no. Will make them happy. Yeah. <laughs> So we carry on with them being read um, on our, not read out, not read out, but we've read them. Right. Well, we, have, we haven't heard them. No, and we'd like to hear them, please. Could, could I just speak for a moment here? One of, what, at the meeting I attended on Sunday. No, not really. Sorry, Michael, that's not no, the way we do it. No, suppress Malfeasance, suppress Can we get the submissions well, sent out to What is the night suit for? You've got a lot to answer for. <laughs> I know. Adolf will be walking through the door shortly. Oh, God. Where's all you here, literally? Indecision, indecision. Paul, can I call a division on that? So the minutes will be part, the submissions will be part of the minutes. Can I call a division on that? Can I call a division on that vote? Division, okay. It wasn't a procedural motion in the end, it was just a motion. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. All right, all those in um, favour of having the minutes, are they? Oh, I'm sorry, David, yes, you go. Councillor Turner? No. Councillor Chen? Yes. Councillor Chu? No. Councillor Coker? Yes. Councillor Potter? No. Councillor Daniels? No. Councillor Davidson? No. Councillor Galloway? Yes. Councillor Goff? No. Uh, Councillor Johansson? Councillor Keon? Yes. Councillor McDonald? No. Councillor Major? Yeah. Councillor McCown? Yes, I have to. Uh, Councillor Scandrick? Yes. Councillor Templeton? No, I'm Sorry? No. Okay, so for the yeses we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. For the noes we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven and one abstention. Right. <coughs> Obviously there was no public forum today. I'd like to move to item three, the confirmation of the previous minutes. Do I have a mover? James, seconder, Sam. All those in favour say aye. 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 Opposed, that's carried. That's the time. Right, so now we move to item 7 and item 8, which are the minutes of the um, Banks Peninsula Water Management Zone Committee and the Christchurch Smelt and Water Management Zone Committee. Do we have a mover for those minutes? Sam, seconder, Andrew, all those in favour say aye. 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 Opposed? That's carried. Right, now we move to item 9, the Organics Processing Plant Development Options. And I'd like to invite staff to the table because we have a short presentation. So we've got Helen and Jason. Would you like to introduce yes. 
Joshua. Joshua, sorry. Would you like to introduce yourself and your role, please, to the meeting? Uh, good morning. Helen Beaumont, Head of Three Waters and Waste, and I have with me Joshua Wilson. Yep, Contract Supervisor for the Organics Processing Plant. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a short presentation which we'll whip through relatively quickly, but then we'll have an opportunity for questions. So the organics processing plant, as you know, is a critical part of our waste management system here in Christchurch and incorporates the, uh, the principles within our waste minimisation strategy. It's also clear that it's contributing to the long-standing odour issues out at Bromley, and so we've, um, we've brought some options to you. To... Mm, David, thank you. Just for some context, the, um, the sites out at, in the Bromley area have been used for transfer station and for green waste composting for quite some time. So 1984 was the first use out at the transfer station and green waste composting since, um, sorry, 1984 and then 1994 for the green waste composting. As you've heard, the organics processing plant itself, as we know it today, <coughs> opened in 2009. It has a considerable throughput, so there are 60 to 70,000 tonnes of organic matter that go through that. Most of that is from our curbside bins, so approximately 50,000 tonnes from the green bins, from curbside. We also take the curbside bins from the Waimakariri District Council, and that's um, a much smaller proportion of it. Also, there is green waste that's dropped off at the, uh, at the Metro Eco Drop and can come directly into the organics processing plant. So that's people bringing trailer loads of um, garden waste, essentially. And there's a small amount of commercial material from industries. Can we move on, David? I don't seem to have control. Thank you very much. The Bromley odour issues have been ongoing for a number of years. It's a bit hard to, um, to read those, but you've heard from the residents today. And these are comments that have come through the Smelt It app about the impact on people, the, um, the constraints on them in terms of using their outdoor area and not wishing to open their windows, um, and the, uh, the ongoing smell on laundry. So there is no doubt about the problems out, out, in, out in Bromley. In terms of those odour issues, they have been documented for many years, and there are, of course, a number of sources of the odours. The organics processing plant is one. Uh, the wastewater treatment plant has been out there for a number of years. The estuary itself can contribute to odours from time to time, particularly in the summer. Uh, there are both municipal and private transfer stations, so there are rubbish odours that are coming through there. There are a number of factories, including fish processors, and then a number of other um, heavy industries. As has been mentioned um, by Alexandra, the Environment Canterbury has focused on the broader odour issues in Bromley, particularly this year, and we've undertaken a pilot project with Environment Canterbury to utilise the community through the smelt it app, so utilise the, um, the community in terms of monitoring odours and then track back to measure the sources of those odours in the Bromley area. And many of you will have seen the, the presentations and the quite sophisticated mapping that's been done in terms of when odours were reported, where they were reported <coughs> and what the prevailing winds were at the time. From that work, Environment Canterbury concluded that 70% of the odour could be considered to be from the organics processing plant or from the transfer station, so it's a, a mix of those. In response to that, the council, together with uh, Living Earth and Eco Central as the operators of those plants, put together an adaptive management plan and have been, um, have been working through the actions in that plan over the past few months. The most significant one for the organics processing plant has been those operational changes and in introducing a new recipe for the compost. So that's um, changing how they make that compost in the tunnels and then what the, what the components of that compost are when they go outside. There's also been a lot of work at the transfer station, which is largely around good housekeeping and making sure that any particularly odorous material that comes in is immediately moved out of the station and into the trucks 
and at the end of each day, everything is tidied up and away, so there's no um, rubbish left in the pits overnight. The, the work at the transfer station has been uh, monitored by the, by the operator and by Environment Canterbury, and that has now been determined to be compliant. So it's within the permitted activity standards in, in the air plan, which means that it's, um, it's not producing offensive and objectionable odours beyond the boundary. So that, that is a very good news story there. For the organics plant, that is, um, is not the case, and the changes that have been made have not made um, a big enough difference to the odours that are produced there. So hence we're moving now to look at the long-term options for that plant. Just, um, I've just put the slide in here just to remind people about what is an offensive and object objectionable odour. And it is, of course, defined under the Resource Management Act, and when we, um, when we measure it, you may think it's quite a subjective thing that what is disgusting to one person is, oh yeah, it's a bit off to another. However, there is quite an objective uh, way of assessing these odours, and there are trained people and um, calibrated noses out there, so you can be sure that, that this is done in an objective way. And it is indeed about these, um, what are known as the Fidol factors. So that's looking <coughs> at the frequency of the odour, so how often those odours are um, experienced, the intensity or the strength of those odours, the duration or how long they persist, uh, the offensiveness, that is the, um, the character of the odour, and indeed a, um, you know, a mushroom farm is different to a bakery, which is different again to a laundry, so there are different characters of odours, uh, and then the context so where those odours are being experienced. So that is, the, um, that is the test, if you like, for what is offensive and objectionable beyond the boundary. In terms of understanding the sources of the odour, as well as the pilot project work that has been done in conjunction with Environment Canterbury, we have also recently run a community survey, and um, we, th we are grateful for those members of the community who, he who responded either on the door-to-door -door survey questions or, um, or through the website and filling in those questions online. And that community survey does indeed demonstrate the extent of the issues in Bromley and the, the number of people that are affected, the number of residents that are affected. We've also done some work, and people will have seen or may have seen um, a truck driving around in the area, sampling the air, and characterising the odorous compounds that are in that air uh, in, the, in different wind situations. So that characterisation of the odour has also been done at the composting plant, and what we're wanting to do is determine what is the profile at the composting plant and what is the profile in the community. And that tells us much the same story as has been told for many years, that yes, there are odorous compounds that are produced at the composting plant found in the community, and there are also other odorous compounds within the community that are not generated by the composting facility. So there is a, um, a mix of odour issues and a number of sources of odour in the area. In terms of the current process, um, photographs are perhaps not a, a great substitute for going to the open days at the plant, but this is just to give you a short overview, and I think I'll hand across to Josh just to step us through the process. Yeah, so um, all curbside material is dropped off in a processing hall, um, so that's got all air extracted through a biofilter. Um, it's then blended and shredded um, and put into composting tunnels, uh, so they're known in the industry as in-vessel in composting units. Um, in, in those composting units, air is kind of pushed through from the bottom, um, and you also have irrigation and temperature controls and that sort of thing in there um, to optimise the, uh, the composting process as much as possible. Once it's uh, finished in the tunnel, which at the moment is about two weeks, um, the compost is then moved outside into managed windrows where it's turned with a, with a windrow turner. That's the maturation phase. Um, and, uh, and that's the area that we're really looking at this in this proposal um, to, to reduce. Um, following that, it's screened for contaminants uh, with the, the process air from that also treated through a biofilter and then um, cured and, and sold mostly into the agricultural market. 
in terms of the, uh, the case for significant redevelopment at the plant, I just want to repeat that the operational changes that have been made have showed an improved stability of the product, but complaints continue to be received, and we are committed to being a good neighbour with this facility. So the facility itself is a vital part of the city infrastructure. Uh, the Council will want to continue to divert waste and meet the goals in our waste minimisation strategy. However, Environment Canterbury have advised that we are in breach of our resource consent and we need to act. The options for redevelopment uh, are technically detailed and extensive. However, there are five main areas. So the first one is a technology upgrade to the present plant. So that is continuing what we do, however significantly upgrading the technology so that we can produce a product that is superior and spends a lot more time in the tunnels compared to the time outside, and we'll put some more details into that. Uh, the second option that we looked at was the enhanced status quo, so that is continuing with the operational enhancements that we're making and continuing to improve the operation of the biofilter and the screening and the sprinkling on the plant. We don't consider that to be sufficient to make a, you know, enough difference to the odour production on the plant. The third one is to enclose the whole process, and that could be done for the process as it is today, um, and also as part of the upgrade, so we'll come back to that one. A longer term option is to consider switching the whole process to anaerobic digestion, and that is one that whatever decision we make today, we want to explore further in the longer term and then the final one to move the facility. The technology upgrade, I'll hand back across to Josh. Yes, yeah, so the, the technology upgrade um, is essentially in those tunnels where um, the initial stages of the composting happens at the moment. Um, it, it's essentially to make sure those tunnels are creating the most optimum um, conditions for, for the composting process. Um, so. The composting plant was built um, just over 10 years ago. Um, it, it's true to say technology has moved on quite a lot in, in that last decade. And essentially, we're bringing it up to the industry standards of today. Um, so part of that is increasing the aeration. That's a, um, probably the most predominant part. So relaying the floor. So there's, um, there's a new floor design. It's called a spigot floor design. And it essentially means that more air can be pushed through the compost so you can, uh, you, you can reach more parts of it and create a more uniform product. And um, there's also upgrades to the doors to create a better seal, upgrades to um, the irrigation system and the monitoring systems. Um, but, but essentially, it's to do with creating those, you know, better, um, that better environment for composting. The, the other part of it, which um, because of the increased aeration at, at the moment, you from the screening process where all the contaminants are removed, some of the bigger material is then uh, organic material is then reprocessed back into the front of the pro, uh, in the tunnels. That's basically to cre create some porosity to allow air to flow through, um, flow through easier, um, and that's basically removed because you you then don't have to have that porosity because the power of the aeration is is great enough to to push through all of the product even if it's finer. Um, so then you create a lot more capacity, which means you could create um, a a system where you don't you can spend more time in the tunnel and it's getting further in the tunnel um, so those are the predominant parts of, of, of the upgrade um, and it, it really does have a significant impact on on the amount of time um, outside did you want me to talk to that as well yep so um, so this um, page basically gives you an idea of, of how successful um, it, it could be or it can be um, so at the moment, about 17% of the process is in the tunnel, so that's the two weeks, and it's eight to 12 weeks outside. Um, with the upgrades, um, we would only need two, uh, four weeks in, we'd need four weeks in the tunnel, and then two weeks outside. So in terms of space, you're looking at 30,000 square meters for maturing compost at the moment, and we're going down to 2,000 square meters. And it's worth noting that that maturing compost isn't. Um, is at a greater level of stability at that point because it's had that longer time in the tunnel. Um, so we have high confidence in it reducing odour significantly um, and it's used... We're, we're fairly unique in, um, in New Zealand. Um, 
in terms of the type of facility there is. Um, when you look to Australia and Europe um, especially, um, you see um, this type of technology being used as standard um, throughout. I think the important thing to note here is the outcome in terms of the potential to produce odour or dust beyond that boundary. So that 90% reduction in the amount of compost material sitting outside is a significant change and a significant decrease in terms of that potential to, um, to produce odours. What we've proposed in the paper is that we take a, um, in the report, is to, that we take a staged approach. So the first stage would be to upgrade the technology and the aeration as outlined there. The second stage would be to monitor the odour and the dust produced from that plant, to work collaboratively with Environment Canterbury, and if necessary, to then further enclose the, the remaining compost area maturing outside. So that would, um, enclose both the maturing compost piles and the screening plant and when the, um, the material is screened and then um, packaged for, sell for being sold. The other thing that we could look at doing is there are, there are two processes on that site. One is through the tunnels and then into the windrows and the other is just green waste processing in windrows outside. And that's the, that's the work that's been going on for, um, for some decades and we have had very few complaints from that. However, with the upgrade, we could look at bringing that green waste processing back into the tunnels and putting it through the, the whole system. So there are a couple of additional things that we could do if the odour was still deemed to be an issue beyond the site. Moving to um, a longer term option of anaerobic digestion, the uh, anaerobic digestion is changing the process completely. So um, it is one, though, that we, uh, we are interested in exploring. And it's also one that could provide us an alternative to the gas that's, landfill gas that's declining from Burwood. And um, we use that gas, of course, to power this building um, and across into the art gallery. So we do want to look at anaerobic digestion as an alternative in the longer term and uh, we'll bring a report back to Council after we've done that work. In terms of procurement, that slide is very difficult to read. However, what, um, what we really wanted to say was that we, would, we could look at a standard procurement timeline, which would take up to 12 months to go through the design procurement uh, and engaging a contractor, or we could look at an expedited procurement timeline uh, in terms of taking action much more quickly, both to, um, to meet the requirements of Environment Canterbury in terms of the adaptive management plan and to, to meet the, the needs of the community for faster action. So we are looking at the options for that procurement. And we're happy to answer questions. Right, thank you, Helen. Um, I've got quite a few here from the um, that have arisen from the the deputations actually, which I would like to um, ask you first of all. Um, I'm just wondering um, why you have not recommended to move the plant. So moving the plant would be. Um, would be a much more expensive process, obviously. We would need to obtain land, and uh, we would also need to obtain a resource consent for using that land for compost processing. Uh, however, what, what we may be doing is simply shifting a problem, and what we really want to do is address the problem. So we, what we would like to do is indeed be good neighbours and reduce both the odour and the dust from that site so that it is not offensive and objectionable beyond that boundary. So you're confident that the option that you've brought forward today is going to achieve that? Yes, we are confident. We're confident in, the, um, in both the advice we've given and also in the experience of other composting plants uh, in Australia and in Europe that we can meet those requirements. Uh, and we are also, that's why, and we're also wanting to take that staged approach so that at each stage we can assess what progress has been made and then take further steps if necessary. And do the other plants um, that you're comparing this one to have residents in such close proximity? Uh, 
Yes, yeah, there, there, are, um, there are plants with, with similar sorts of um, yeah, residential areas in, in the region. Yeah, because I'm quite concerned about the, the uh, compost dust in the air and the particulates and so leaving the, that 2,000 square metres open might not be... I, I can touch on the dust. Um, so the, the dust has um, not been an issue in terms of the consent um, guidelines. Um, we have dust gauges, um, both upwind, downwind and around site. Um, they tend to show that there is higher general dust, that's dust not linked to composting, than organic dust, um, which is what is expected to be linked to composting. Um, and there tends to be more dust upwind than downwind of site. Um, so, so we're confident that dust experienced by the community is, is not coming from the organics plant. Okay, and if um, the other factor, the question I had around moving it, you've mentioned money, finding the land, getting the consent. What do you think would be a time frame if we would be looking at to do that? Uh, I would expect that to be a three to five year time frame. Do you know how long Cape Valley took? I think it was longer uh, than that. Five to seven. Yeah, five to seven years. However, that was a much, much larger facility. Okay, and the other question I have is, um, why have you not recommended to just close it and take it all to landfill? That is an option if council um, wishes to pursue it. However, the, that would go against the waste minimisation and management strategy that we have just adopted. So that strategy is looking at minimising waste to landfill uh, and dealing with the waste in the, in the most environmentally friendly manner. So um, that is not recommended. Okay, Doak. And the other concern I have is around the adequacy of the biofilter. So you've mentioned in the recommendation that that will be upgraded. Um, and Geoffrey King, I think, mentioned a, a water method that it should be um, run through. Do you have any comments on whether you think the biofilter upgrade will be adequate to deal with uh, a higher amount going through the tunnels, with more air being pumped into the tunnels? So, so the, the biofilter upgrade um, does two things. Um, so obviously there's more air being pushed through, so it has to be bigger to cope with that amount of air. Yeah. Um, and it also splits it in uh, to two sections, which basically creates a level of redundancy should any repairs need to be done. At present, um, we don't think there is any issue arising from the biofilter. From the um, assessments done throughout the March pilot um, and since, um, it's mainly focused um, or the is mainly focused on those um, windrows um, and ECAN haven't advised us uh, formally of any issue with the odour from the biofilter so we're, so we're fairly confident it's or we're, we're very confident it's doing its job um, it's a very well used technology and used in multiple other places in Bromley and, and around New Zealand and globally um, so we don't see any any issue um, arising from the biofilter or the upgrades that are needed. All right, there just seems to be a community perception that the biofilter might not be doing its job. And um, the, my other question, Helen, is, and this has come from a submitter, do you think that the options presented today are tinkering at the edges, or do you think it's something more substantial than that? Uh, one of the options here today could be described as tinkering with the edges, and that's the enhanced status quo. Uh, however, we're not recommending that. We do not think that will make a significant change. I think that the, um, the technology upgrade is a step change in, um, in odour management and odour control on that site. Thank you. Aaron, Tim, Mike, Melanie. Yeah, so thank you, Helen. So it's been pretty Thanks. obvious for a number of years that the residents around there um, just want no odour from this particular site. They probably accept there's others um, that come from Bromley, but the, we're talking about this particular site. If we go for your recommendation today, what will be the approximate date they will not smell anything from this particular site? Uh, that does depend on the, um, on the procurement approach. So the longest would be two years, um, and we would hope to do it faster than that. Yeah, so the, ex the expedited one? Uh, I, I can't give you a time frame for the expedited one because we'd have to explore what we can do with our procurement people, see what available contractors we have, um, but we would be working to do that as soon as possible. And the million dollar question, 
Will all of these upgrades mean they no longer smell the plant? We consider that um, that this will be a, a significant improvement from the plant. I think that it will easily meet the test in terms of no offensive and objectionable odours beyond the boundary. Will there be zero odours? No, I don't think so. So I think that it will minimise the odour issues from this site. Thank you. Um, Tim, and just before we come to you, um, the written submissions have been printed out and they're on the round table there if anyone would like to grab one from the gallery. Tim? Uh, <coughs> excuse me, thank you. Um, just when you were explaining that uh, the technology upgrade, it seemed that you were more interested, or it just seemed there's a waiting on the production process rather than the emphasis on reducing odour. What are your comments? I mean, it's just what I perhaps see, perceived from what you were saying. So I just, can you clarify that? I've got a couple of questions. So, um, the odour at the moment is uh, predominantly focused from the maturing window, windrows outside. Um, that's essentially because <coughs> there's too much activity happening in them. Mm. Essentially, there's too much breakdown of organic material in those windrows, which has an odour to it. By increasing the amount of that degra um, degradation within the tunnels, you essentially remove that odour from outside, and you put mm. that odour is being produced in the tunnels, which mm. is then treated through the biofilter. So having a better process and production um, at the front end solves odour at the tail end of the process. Thank you. And um, there's been comment with regards to, and it's an industrial area, and I went to school in Wollstone that you know, Marshall Street East was right by Davis Gelatine, etc. So there is obviously a, a difference in this area than those other areas. A Hornby would be another one, etc. So I'm just wondering, had an idea of whilst there is the technology upgrade, if that is the way we go, that there would be, could there be a, um, a, a stop of... Um, organics going to the plant whilst the upgrade is being undertaken and then resuming after it's been taken, being put in, if that's the way we go. So a temporary stop of the organics going there whilst the upgrades are being undertaken. There, there would be a significant operational cost to council for that. Um, so it, it, it was estimated for any shutdown of the facility, it's going to be at about $750,000 a month. Um, to then take that material to, to landfill whilst the upgrade's happening. Um, we want to minimise that, both for the financial reasons um, and the waste minimisation reasons. Um, but if you've got the plant not working whilst you upgrade, would that not reduce the time frame needed to upgrade? Yes, it would, yeah. So, and what would be the estimated time? What's the estimated time in the report? Well, well again, it, it depends on the procurement process, um, but from construction, um, the, the estimate, and this is all based on a detailed scope of works, which is which is yeah, pending which this decision. Here. Yeah, um, but but the estimate was you could probably do them in two stages over kind of three to five months, and you could probably do it all in uh, yeah five to six months, and because you would just get more staff um, and more more um, yeah more workers in to, to do that work. Um, so so there's not a great difference in the amount of actual construction time, um, but if you did them in a staged approach, it would potentially be over a two year period because you'd want to do it in that low season where there's less material coming in. Um, so you're, yeah, autumn, winter. Um, so, it was, so it wasn't, you know, I guess it wasn't really considered to close the plant for a short period, shorter period of time to get the upgrade done in one hit and then start it again. Yes, yeah, that, yeah I realise that was the one cost, of the options. but there's a cost to the community as well. So, so that is one of the options that we'd like to explore once okay. we have a detailed scope of work and through the procurement process. Yeah, thank you. To close it while you do the work. That is one of the yeah. options, but um, until we uh, until we have that detail yeah. and and have some response in terms of doing the works, we won't be able to um, we won't be able to sort of define what that timeline would be. Right. Okay, um, Mike. Thank you. Um, it's roughly about five percent of the um, waste going into the plant is from commercial um, food waste. What would be the impact if that was removed as a waste stream? And in, in what sense the impact in, in terms uh, of odour? Or? Yeah, in terms of odour. So, so there's no evidence to suggest that it has any impact on odour. Obviously, within within the green bins, there is. Um, already food waste, um, and that's um, bulked up by the, the green waste as well. Um, so in a composting 
process, you want to have the right um, ra ratios of different material. Um, so essentially, you want to create a uniform material going into the process at the start. So any food waste coming in from private operators, which is predominantly food waste, ha then has to be mixed with um, your, yeah, your more grassy and woody materials um, anyway to then produce that right mix. Um, so there's, there's no evidence to suggest it would have any impact on odour um, at, at this stage. Okay. And so I guess then if we looked at all food scraps, food waste going there, um, removing that, that would obviously uh, upset the balance of the compost itself, but would it actually improve the odour? Or I'm just... so, so if you went for a green waste only option, um, you would expect um, some improvement with odour because that's essentially what was done prior to 2009 when there was uh, no odour complaints at all. Um, the, the implications of that um, are that you, uh, it's about um, 15 to 25 per cent, depending on the time of year, um, of the material coming in in the green bins is food waste. Um, so then that material then is no longer diverted um, and would have to go in the red bins and then you'd have to address how you collect the red bins um, because we'd be unlikely to do it on a um, two weekly cycle mm -hmm. um, because of the producible nature of that, that material. Okay. And removing the food waste, though, would that affect the process cycle? So, so green, green waste can be composted on its own. Um, food waste on its own can't be yeah. composted. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And just before we come to Mel, you've got a question. Aaron, your answer was in the presentation, which was if the expedited procurement model would be completed next summer, if it went well. Mel? Um, I was wondering why the final step about maturing outside, why does that happen? What's the point of it? So the um, final maturation is a part of the composting process to ensure that it is ready for application to, to land. Um, so, so essentially, if, if you have compost that has not had a time to mature and cure, um, if you put it on land, the um, nitrogen's not, yeah, it's not linked into the compost properly, and, and it essentially is, isn't good for the plant. So you have to have a period where it, it matures um, to, to do that. Um, with these upgrades, um, it, the predominant actual activity is ha happening in the tunnels, but you just need that time for it to rest and, um, and mature before it can be sold to customers. So it's purely about it resting. So, um, and then you've talked about the, the second step could potentially be, if we went with the recommendation today, would be about enclosing that. Um, why have you not just recommended enclosing it completely in this report today? So we have confidence that um, that material outside will not have an odour that is considered offensive and objectionable. Um, and essentially it's, it's money that doesn't need to be spent at this stage. Um, we've included that as a potential option, um, obviously um, for, for councillors to consider, um, because it is the lowest risk option, um, because everything would be treated through a biofilter which is controlled, um, but we have high confidence it won't be required. Okay, and then um, lastly was just about um, the option um, about sending everything to landfill. Can, can that just be explained about um, the potential cost of the cost of that, including the levy um, and the effect on rates it could have if everything was just ending up in landfill? Y yep, so um, there, there's two parts of it. So um, if we send it to landfill, that's a significantly higher gate fee, so that's the fee we pay per tonne. Um, there, there is a slight reduction in collection costs because we wouldn't be collecting a green bin. Um, it would be a two bin system rather than a three bin system. Um, but at the moment, um, you, you may have seen the um, central government are making moves to increase cost to dispose of landfill, and that's going up incrementally. Um, so it's going up by, you know, it was $10 a tonne, now it's 20 and it'll be up to 50 And there's the potential for that to increase further beyond that. Um, part of that is half of the money goes um, to projects through the Waste Minimisation Fund, and the other half comes back to councils. Um, there, there is a risk if we move away from diversion um, that we'll lose that, um, that income, um, which is at, at the moment um, minimal, but um, it will grow as the um, 
levy increases because it's going up by such a such a massive rate compared to where it was. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, James. Kia ora. Uh, the deputations um, were fairly consistent in calling on relocation. So, can you just confirm? And, and that's been raised already. But uh, can you confirm <coughs> there are three um, issues: the consent, finding land, and the dollars. Firstly, I know it's in the paper, but can you just confirm what the cost would be to relocate? That is in the paper, isn't it? Yeah, I can uh, I can do that. So uh, a full re relocation. Um, so the capital expenditure is uh, is 70 million or just under, um, and then the operational expenditure is 1.8 million. Um, that operational expenditure is primarily based on the um, increased transport costs, which has associated <coughs> environmental impacts in terms of um, trucking. Um, so there's um, because we would be looking at a site that is has no um, immediate neighbouring residents, um, you would need to take it fairly far out of the city, which then when you're talking about the green trucks doing that, every time they need to dump a load, it, it adds significant cost on to, to council operationally. So do, is that suggesting that you've got an idea of where it would go if it was to be relocated? So it's based on the, the Becker report, um, which was from 2015. Um, my recollection that was they, they estimated just a area 50 kilometres away from the city would suffice. Um, but um, yeah, I'd need to double check the report, but I'm pretty sure it's 50 kilometres. <coughs> okay. Then, uh, like Ellen, let's imagine that there's no OPP plant, there's no organic processing plant in Bromley. Imagine that. In this day and age, would you cite such an operation in a residential area? Uh, so at, at present there are a large number of um, such industries out in the Bromley area. I mean, for example, the waste... Answer the question. Get off. Answer the question. For example, the waste... Not even qualified. For example, the wastewater treatment plant is located out in Bromley, um, and that has been significantly upgraded over the years. I think um, one of the, there, there are two issues here. One, one is um, what you do with plants that have been there historically, um, and residents um, are affected by that over a number of years and have less tolerance of it. I think that, that's one of the issues you have to consider. Um, if you're putting a new plant in, it would depend on the technology and what you can do in terms of the odour mitigation. So uh, in terms of the anaerobic digestion, yes, we certainly would look at locating anaerobic digestion out in that area. Um, perhaps not exactly on that site. It might make more sense to put it on the wastewater treatment plant site and put it adjacent to the digesters that we use out there for, um, for wastewater treatment. Um, so there's, um, there's not a problem in terms of residential neighbours, although it is ideal to have a buffer zone, so between any residential neighbours and any sort of heavy industry that produces noise, odour, <laughs> dust. Okay. Well, thank you. And then these are all questions, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you aware that I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate the work that staff have done in, on this matter because it's very important and it needs to be respected by everybody that work, hard work has been put into it and uh, are you also aware that we, I recognise that uh, Yani has been at the forefront of this, however the decision rests with the people sitting around this chamber. Are you aware of that? <laughs> Very good question, James. And um, I would like to endorse what James has said. And can we please continue a respectful manner in the chamber? We're working very hard to come to some sort of resolution about this problem for the people who are most directly affected and for the people of Christchurch. And um, I promise you that we are working hard. And I also appreciate the amount of work staff have put into this this year. So. Questions continue. Anne. Kia ora, and thank you. No, 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 no. Um, Anne Galloway's got a question. Twenty-five of the population of this city. Anne, question. Well, I'm going to adjourn after questions for a cup of coffee. So, Anne. Thank you, Kia ora, and thank you, Helen and Josh, for the clear way you've answered the questions and the clear way you've presented 
really technical information, we appreciate it. Um, we heard um, from several submitters uh, that it would be great to have a workshop, a technical workshop, to understand uh, this information, to understand what is proposed, and also a site visit. How quickly could that be done? And if it could be done, you know, in the next two weeks or so, what impact would that have on, on, on what we're doing today in terms of a timeline? If we were to press pause to get that information to people before a decision is made? Um, certainly we could hold a technical workshop within the next two weeks. Uh, a site visit we would need to um, talk to Living Earth and negotiate whether, when we could have access to the site. Uh, they have recently held an open day. I think it, was uh, it, was, it was cancelled due to, to COVID. Oh, OK. So, yeah, so they do, they do run open days from time to time, as do the eco-central facilities, but um, we could certainly look to arrange a site visit. So it seems to me there would be benefit in being able to do that before we made a decision about this, to bring people along. As we've talked about, we want to be good neighbours, we want to collaborate, we want to build relationships. Um, is that going to be a problem if we decide to press pause today? Um, that's, a, that's a question for councillors to I think, answer. I think what um, Anne's asking, what's the impact on the timeline? If it was, it would be, the decision would, would be delayed till the 18th of December, which would be a month. What's the impact of that? It, there would be very little impact on our timeline because we would um, continue to do the work that can be done in parallel. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Anne, that's a good question. Sarah? Thank you. Um, I'm interested in the anaerobic um, digestion as, as an option for the future. So if, if we went ahead with the, the current proposal on the site where we're you know, upgrading and trying to um, do all we can to get rid of the odours, would the, the paper with the option um, of anaerobic digestion still be to us in, not just um, ahead of the contract, because that could be six months ahead of the contract, but actually in time to do enough work to get it going so it would be in place for the end of the contract, if you like, so that we could just switch? So, I mean, there's a significant investment proposed for the upgrade of the plant now. I'm assuming there would be um, a significant investment for changing the whole process as well um, in the site. So what would the time frames around that one be? Because that seems like an option that would sort of eliminate odour. Um, so in terms of the anaerobic digestion, what, what's being um, looked at um, predominantly is it's not a complete um, change in the entire process. It's an okay. additional process. Um, so the, the type of anaerobic digestion you would likely use for a mixed system, which is green waste and food waste together, rather than just food waste um, like uh, Auckland's just bringing in now, um, is dry anaerobic digestion. Yeah. Um, the material that's left over from that, the kind of solid material, um, would then usually go through an aerated composting process, such as what we, we've got now. So it would be an addition to that. Um, so, so we could, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure in terms of time frames. I think that would be something we'd have to, to look into exactly when we could bring that back to you, but it wouldn't um, completely change the whole process. It would be a, a pre-process to, to that. <coughs> okay, but um, to get, if, if, we, if it was looking positive, actually having that information well ahead of the contract ending would make our job much easier when it came to new contracts, if you like. Mm. Yes, so, yeah. yes. Okay. Thank you. Jimmy, okay, thank and you. then, then Andrew, then Yanni. Based on your PowerPoint uh, presentation, you got into the anaerobic Good uh, bullet point. Uh, you particularly emphasize the risk, uh, risk of declining landfill uh, gas, and the more time required to investigate and evaluate option available. And also, I reviewed uh, your uh, meeting agenda page on 34, uh, 3.16.4. You also uh, emphasize some uncertainty, particular the uh, the the you know the whether the turner of the living earth composting facility could be upgraded. The standard require, you know, this in a, uh, the aerobic direction. So I just want to know, because there's a technical the, the report and document, whether this is mature or not mature, this report, because they have uncertainty and also is some of risk. This is my question. Is, is this just on anaerobic digestion? Yes. Um, yeah, so that's exactly why we want to do further feasibility studies in, into it. Um, we, we 
there are a lot of risks to it. It would be um, a dry AD plant would be the first of its kind in New Zealand. Yes. Um, and we want to make sure we do our due diligence and investigate all the options. Yes. Um, so that's why we want to do further investigation. Okay. Um, the, the risk in terms of the tunnels, um, that's whether you could retrofit the current composting tunnels to be gas tight yes. and then make them uh, anaerobic digesters, yes. or whether you'd have to build additional tunnels um, as, along with the existing <coughs> tunnels. Um, so that's more of a, a technical aspect which will have to be worked through. Okay. In, in those feasibility studies. Okay, so there's an ongoing assessment. Mm, absolutely. Ongoing. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Andrew. Um, thank you. I just wanted to drill down into the um, potential for deferring the paper to give more time for engagement with the community. Um, so if we were to defer the decision until what I understand from the previous question would be the 18th of December, um, just to confirm that wouldn't cause any substantive delay in the work that would follow from a decision that we would make at that time? Yep, do you want to? Sorry, so just uh, in terms of our procurement timeline, uh, the next phase of works being proposed is to get a detailed scope of works for this project. The cutoff for procurement window is the 18th of December. So we, we really seek a decision today so that we can engage that next phase of works so that we can get the technical design and come back to council in the new year with a, with a, with a plan to, to develop this plant. So by delaying it out to the 18th of December, we've missed that window and we push the timeline back in, into the new year. Okay, um, so follow on question from that. If we were to do that, and I'm mindful of the comments that we've heard from people making deputations today, from the community today, about the lack of time to engage and fully understand the options in the report. Do we have capacity and capability um, to support community meetings or, or other meaningful engagement with the community, particularly given that we've heard there's a community group to be formed, which I'm hopeful might mean that there is an opportunity for better engagement with and better engagement from the community. Have we got capacity to, to, to engage meaningfully in a way that might improve community understanding and mm. support of the options? That was the question Anne just asked. I'm, I'm looking across at my friends from um, communications and engagement. Well, I guess where I'm coming from, if we were going to defer, we need to understand we're doing that for a good reason. Yes, so in terms of the technical team here, yes, we could do that work. Um, we, it, there'd be a question in my mind as to whether or not we develop the technical scope of works in parallel as well, pending the council decision. Um, that may mean some rework if the council makes a different decision, but it would also enable us to, um, to be out on the front foot uh, in time. So, I mean, it, there, are, there are a number of questions to, to hold in your mind there. All but right. yes, we could do some technical workshops with the community. And, and indeed, we could do technical workshops with the community whether you make a decision or defer a decision. Yes. Um, yes. So we could still do technical workshops with the community yep, in terms of yep. improving the understanding of what the technology is there today and what is proposed in terms of the odour mitigation. Yep. All right, thank and, you. And we will have continued relationships and uh, engagement with the community as time goes on anyway. But I'm a little bit confused now because, Helen, your response to Anne's question was that it will make very little difference to the time frame. And Rowan's come and said it will make a difference if we defer. Yes, the but I, what, in responding to, um, to Anne's question, I would have continued the prep, preparation work that we're doing now, pending the council decision. But so we would develop the scope of works, um, but it, it, we would need to wait for the council decision before we put it out. Before you go embark on procurement. And the 18th is too late, did you say? Is that Rowan? the last day we can put them out? That's the cut-off date. So an option might be to try and squeeze it into another meeting before that, but, pardon? Okay. Yeah. All right, we'll keep with going with the questions. Yani. And then Thank you. Um, I just wanted to check on the, um, as part of the adaptive management plan, uh, we had three months to significantly reduce the odours, uh, and that didn't happen. We were told that the uh, recipe was going to be a solution. Can you just tell me why the recipe has failed? And how many odour complaints we've had 
um, in November and how many non-compliances to date. Mm. Um, so on the second part of the question, um, I don't know the exact number of ODA complaints. Um, we, yeah, the last reporting period was at the CLG um, <coughs> where we, we got some of those details, uh, but that didn't include November. Um, that information is held by Environment Canterbury. Um, in terms of the um, uh, recipe, um, I think the, the key thing is the, the recipe and the operational changes were really designed to fix the problem as quickly as possible. Um, and there were a number of trials tested um, and then selected based on how successful they were. Um, the, the recipe has shown a significant improvement in the stability of the compost. Um, that's using a, a standard called the Solvita test, um, which measures the stability. Um, now, there's, there's a couple of issues. Um, of, obviously, that doesn't completely mean there's, there's no odour. And, and what we're proposing with this um, upgrade is to increase that even further. Um, so when it goes outside, the Solvita test will be essentially at a practical maturity state um, where it's ready for sale. It just needs that settling. But I, think, I think what people are struggling to understand is all this three-month focus on improvement the problem seems to be getting worse. Yep. The complaints last week were okay. Yanni, we've appreciated that. High. We're so, moving forward today. Well, how can people have confidence in what you're proposing, given what was proposed in part of the three months? All right. The question failed? is, can people have confidence that what your proposal is today is going to make a big difference? So we are we are not proposing to continue with the um, improving the operational um, recipe recipe changes. Yep. Yep. Um, although we will continue to do that. Um, you know, while the plant is operating as it is, what we're proposing today is a step change in the technology. Oh, okay. So but there will be, um, so for, I think the, the biggest change is that there will be only 10% of the material maturing outside that, that is there today. So that is a significant change in terms of the potential to produce either odour or dust from yeah. having um, a 90% reduction in the material stored outside on site. Right, but that is the biggest change. What I was trying that, to understand. That material will also be more mature, so that um, that is is clearly um, reducing the potential for odour. But what I was trying to understand has the recipe actually made the situation worse? The change yeah. to the recipe, because why are we getting so many complaints now compared to three months ago? So we haven't got the the latest um, information from Environment Canterbury on that. So I'm not able to, to answer that. But you're right, there hasn't been a significant improvement from the changes made through the Adaptive Management Plan with respect to the Organics Processing Plan. That's why we're here today, yes. proposing a significant investment to make those improvements. Thank you, so for the, um, for the Eco Central Eco Drop site, we have seen significant improvements and we're, you know, we're very pleased and Environment Canterbury are satisfied that that has made a difference from to the odours from that site. That's now compliant. So, so that, site, that site, well yes, it's, it's not only is it compliant, but it's it's not producing offensive and objectionable odours. That is the really important part so of it. I was, I was really interested to understand in terms of why the current design build operate, um, why that hasn't worked and where the accountability is. And um, can, I, no, Yanni, we are moving forward today. Um, okay, Joshua's well, well, already one touched of the questions, on one of the why the plant is in the condition that it is today, and we're choosing options that are going to upgrade the facility. We're not going to get into the contract discussion today, I'm sorry. Well, can I just ask then, because one of the deputations made reference to the fact that when it was built, that the um, uh, it should be basically um, under odour generating parts of the treatment process shall be maintained under negative air pressure to prevent odour release. Extracted air shall be treated before release. All treatment plant processes which produce or have potential to produce significant odour shall be enclosed. We just heard from staff in answer to one of the other questions that the outdoor windrows have an odour to it which is causing the problem. So can I ask can I why let, let it Joshua isn't fully enclosed that. now when that was what was supposed to be done at the time it was built? So, so um, in the documents when it was uh, first built, yeah, all odour producing areas of the plant were supposed to be under negative pressure. It was also allowed in the consent, and there's a specific consent condition for this, that managed windrows are allowed outside. We find ourselves in a position now where those windrows are the source of an odour, and 
this upgrade is to remedy that. Thank you. Phil, you have a question? Forward so that we can have confidence. So can we I just can we just move forward and say what I, what what um, monitoring will be done um, when you've implemented modeling. the change? Modelling. It's modelling in terms of the design. Modeling. So there would have been odor modelling done, I hope, as part of the design to build it. What I'm trying to understand. What does that modelling look like then, and what does it look like now with what you're proposing, and what's actually happening? I don't have the detail on when the plant was built. Um, in terms of moving forward, um, we would look to put in a performance guarantee in any um, design we do, which would involve um, odour. Um, so, so normally how they work is you do a detailed odour assessment of the area prior to the rebuild, and then you do one after, and then they're compared to confirm that it's had the impact it would have. Um, a lot of that work, um, when we look overseas to examples, we're very confident that the... Um, tests that um, in terms of the maturity and um, that sort of thing is sufficient um, but we would look to put that into any any contract to build the upgrades thank you that's a good answer just leave that with the chair but just to let councillors know that a number of seven questions were put in um, and I still had no answer to that on Friday so I just wanted to record that um, which you know is a bit disappointing um, and just the, um, really, I guess the, the, the question I was really keen to understand from um, two final questions. One is, do we have the number of complaints that have been made since the plant was set up in its current form? How many were investigated and how many have been non-complying? We don't have that level of detail today. Um, we, we can go back and, and try and find it. It'll be a big piece of work and um, a lot of it was held by Environment Canterbury and they'll be able to on-charge us to do the administration of that work, but um, we, we could definitely ask But in terms it. of understanding the community impact, I, I thought that should be recorded on an annual basis. It should be pretty easy to get. So, so we, can def yeah, we can definitely do the number of complaints um, and the number of non-compliances. Okay. Th this year is slightly um, different because of the Smelter app, where they're not recorded against an individual yeah. site. It's just a, a type of voter okay. and then investigating. And the final question from me was in regards to the... Um, Local Government Act and the Council Policy on Significance and Engagement, where um, we, my understanding is that Council um, has a duty to ensure that communities will be engaged and that we will seek community views on matters of high significance, which this has been seen to be. Um, and that's supposed to be done in a timely fashion, which gives the community an opportunity to understand uh, the options. Can you just, I mean, I did put this in, but I would just like someone to give us advice on the assessment around our significance and engagement policy as to seeking community views All right, on Yanni, the actual options. All right, Yanni, we'll get Ian Thompson down here for when we come back from yeah, morning tea. Thank you. Um, Phil, one last question, and then we'll break. Hi, thank you. Could could you please go back two, two slides, if possible, to where it says reduction of compost odour? Oh, outdoor, sorry. That's yep. One. Now, if we build the, the at the moment, it's all maturing in the large area, is mm -hmm. that right? So when, we, when it all matures in the small area, as soon as it's out of there, it'll be gone off site. So it won't be lying around outside. Um, th that's... As it sells. So, so at the moment, that's how it works. Um, and we've made no decision on, on how that would work in the, in the future. C c what, what I'm getting at, all the stuff in the large blue area is sitting there maturing because it's not mature enough to get rid of. Yeah. Is it right? So if it's all maturing in the wee shed, as soon as it comes out of the wee shed, it should be able to leave site. No, so those aren't sheds. They're just areas of oh, all right, maturation. Area. So at the moment, the area um, above the large area in the left-hand photo is yes. compost that's being screened, so it's ready for sale, and it's just curing and waiting to, to so be what, sold. What I'm getting at is because it's not covered, you're still going to get dust. Yeah. Whether it's... If no, we just asked that question, and Josh, you, you want to answer that one again? So you're going down from 30,000 uh -huh. square metres to 2,000, and you, your reply to the dust issue, can you repeat that? Well, well, before, before we go there, and I don't, I don't think we need to repeat that, I think, yes, you're correct, there is still the potential for both odour and dust from the smaller area, be it significant, albeit significantly reduced. However, 
That's why we've said, as stage two, we'll, cons we'll monitor the odour and the dust production from there and further enclose if necessary. So that's part of what you're, what you're um, considering today. Yeah, what I'm sort of trying to get to, you do stockpile stuff there that's ready to sell, but it's not sold. It's not as if it's, as soon as it's finished, out of any maturing area. Yeah, it, it, it's gone instantly, or you stop piling it there, waiting for it to go. It's, it's there, ready, ready to sell, yeah. OK, so there is a stockpile of it, which can have dust coming off it when it's blowing like crazy. Yep. Sort of, you know. y yes, it could, but um, there's, there's controls in place to stop that. So you haven't achieved anything? So um, that, that is an option that stage two be brought forward and completed at the same time. So are there any more questions? Just a question for you, um, Madam Chair. Just yeah. wondering over the break, if there's an opportunity to talk with staff a little bit more about the implications of moving this decision. Um, I'd appreciate it. Well, we'll it. do that in a public meeting yeah. when we get well, back, okay. if that's what that you want to. Just we to can, have, we can have more questions when we get yeah, back, if we want. Good. Thank you. So we'll um, adjourn for 15 minutes. This time. Turn two. I'm just concerned about time. We've got the agenda to get through, so if we can be back by 11.45, it's 10 minutes.
<laughs> All right, so we now have um, welcome Ian Thompson, our legal advisor at the table, and uh, Yanni has uh, one final question to put to you about the level of significance and consultation. So fire away, Yanni. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just mindful of um, what happened with the city housing rent increase case when it went before the High Court, the judicial review. And my understanding in terms of our obligations under the Local Government Act are that when we have a significance and engagement policy and we do an assessment of something of being of high significance, that there are obligations under us to seek community views in a manner that enables the community to understand in a timely way the options and issues being put forward to council before a decision. Now, in the High Court case with the city housing, um, one of the criticisms was that the option to get government funding wasn't fully canvassed and the views of tenants weren't sought. So with that in mind, I'm really interested to understand why we're not having a process to seek community views on the options being put forward in this report and how we can rely on the fact that people have said there's an odour as being sufficient. Thank you. Um, a couple of points in response to that. Um, yes, the, the report acknowledges that this is a matter of high significance, and that is reflected in the extent and the detail of the, of the material that you've got in front of you. There are options identified and assessed. There have been independent reports um, and a peer review which reflects the fact that this is a significant matter. When it comes to um, engaging with the community, it's fair to say that you've got a pretty good idea of what the community views are in connection with this matter, and that is that they want the odour <coughs> reduced, removed if possible. You're also aware that there are a group of people in the community who want the um, facility removed from its current site. And you've got that option in the material in front of you for you to consider. So my take on it is that, yes, it's significant. The community is aware of the issues, is aware um, of the um, the fact that the council is working towards um, reducing the odour and frankly wants the council to get on with it. The other aspect is that if the council doesn't act quickly, um, it's likely that ECAN may take the decision out of your hands and require you to um, take steps. So it's, a, it's not too dissimilar from the issue we had with coronation back in 2018, where if the council didn't take steps, the medical officer of health was going to. So I'm relatively comfortable with the position that we're in. Um, I'm aware that there has been community engagement, and I understand that staff have committed to you that they will continue with that engagement and ensure that the, co the community is alongside the council in terms of the work that's going to be done to, if you make that decision, if you uh, proceed with the um, work that's recommended. Sorry, just, just check. So the local community board hasn't had their view sought, and the questions that people have raised this morning and the um, questions that have been raised in the letters in regards for request for more time. Um, with what we've heard and what's been said in terms of the community board, our policy that says we'll work to ensure community is sufficiently informed to understand the issue or proposal, options, impacts, and has time to respond so that they're able to participate in an engagement process with confidence. Are you saying that, based on what we've heard this morning, that we can have confidence that that's the case? I I think so, but it's also open for the council to um, re require further engagement if that's what you, you wish to do. Um, 
if you think there hasn't been sufficient engagement so far? I guess what concerns me most is the fact that we've got a series of options, not about the odour in terms of the wider issue, but specific options to deal with the odour that we have not specifically sought the community view on. And that's what I'm having problems understanding how we can have confidence in what our significance and engagement policy says. What, what, you, what you have got is a very detailed assessment of what would be required to address the odour problem. And you would have to perhaps question whether consultation um, on those options would achieve any further, um, get you any further towards solving the problem. It's a very detailed report. It has identified the options and um, assessed them. Just, you gave an example of the coronation issue, but another regulatory issue is the Akawa wastewater treatment plant. Given how much extensive community engagement has been uh, done in that in terms of a community working party uh, and several co rounds of consultation on the options, can you just explain why that is different to this? I think that that is a, f a, a far wider issue and had a lot of um, complexities, intricacies in it that I don't quite oh. see the same with yes. this particular yeah. issue. There is a problem to be addressed. The council is, um, has received advice on how it can be addressed. And I don't think really the two situations are um, quite the same. OK, I agree with that answer too. Thank you, Ian. Um, look, in the light of the, um, the public participation today and the interest in this and the desire for the community to actually be more informed about the technicalities of the options, I'm just going to lay this item on the table for now, deal with the rest of the agenda items, with a view of at the end of the, this meeting I'm going to propose an adjournment to give time for the staff to give a technical uh, presentation or information dissemination session to uh, the, mem the members of the public, it'll be a public meeting, which will include the, um, the options, the advantages and disadvantages and the proposed outcomes from that. And also it'll give time for a site visit um, for the community to go and make a visit to the plant and um, then we have a date uh, to come back to the meeting to recommence, which will be 4pm on the 9th of December. But I'll deal with that at the end of the meeting, so I'm going to lay this on the table for now and continue with the rest of the, the meeting agenda. So that takes us now to item 10. Do we need to vote on that? 10. Or? Um, do we have Diane here today for this? Um, sorry. Mm, All right, so we've got before us a paper on the um, Zone Committee review. Um, I'll take this as read. We've had uh, workshops and we've had councillors, um, Anne Galloway, James, myself, is there anyone else working on the uh, proposed? These are not major changes to the zone committees. Oh, here's Paul. No, he's at um, But they are um, just tidying up and tightening up uh, what we are expecting from the zone committees and our involvement in them. Here's Diane. Can you give us a quick introduction um, before we... Welcome. Thank you. Kia ora, councillors. Um, just as a brief background, um, you may recall that the Canterbury Water Management Strategy was adopted by all of the councils in the region a bit more than 10 years ago. So it was about time to look at the CWMS and its implementation. So in mid-2018, the Mayoral Forum initiated the Fit for Future program. Um, and one of the elements of the program was um, adding some interim targets. In addition, um, last year, as part of that program, the mayoral forum asked Environment Canterbury to lead some work on looking at shifting the focus of the zone committees um, to focusing more on actions on the ground. Yeah. 
So as a result of that work, uh, the re review has produced three notable changes to the way the, it's proposed, um, to the way that the zone committees um, work. One is a new letter of shared priorities that would go to each of the zone committees, so there are 10 of them. And the letters which set out the priorities for both Environment Canterbury and the district council or district councils within each zone. There are also some proposed changes to the generic terms of reference. And um, the third notable change is a new requirement for, the, for each zone committee to prepare an action plan and then to report on how they're, <coughs> excuse me, how they're implementing them. Um, internally, um, council staff met with um, Deputy Mayor Turner and Councilors Cotter, Daniels, and Galloway to look at the proposed changes. In the report, I've referred to um, this as a working party, just for brevity. Um, the working party looked um, at the letter of shared priorities and recommended um, that there be a basically a single priority for the city council that would go to all three of the zone committees, and that's um, included in section 3.10 of your report and basically the the high level um, shared priority is public awareness and engagement um, in discussions amongst the working party when we met a couple of times it was felt that that was the, probably the most important thing that the zone committees could do um, additionally in terms of the proposed changes to the generic terms of reference, um, the working party was um, pretty comfortable with um, what was being proposed in terms of the changes to the generic terms of reference, but they did seek an important addition to the terms of reference, and that was to allow nomination nominations of alternates for the council representatives. Um, right now, the current and the proposed terms of reference only allow for alternates for the Runanga representatives. Um, it was also felt that for the alternates, that um, alternates to the council's representatives should be community board members. Informally, there has been some discussion of a proposed change that was specific to the Christchurch West Melton Zone Committee, and that was for um, an increase in the number of elected members for a total of up to five. Um, this was not supported by the zone committee. It wasn't re supported by the Runaga representatives, nor was it supported by the um, working mm -hmm. party. So it was felt that one, um, a, as with the other zone committees, it was felt that one council representative was the appropriate um, level of representation. That's pretty much, a, I guess, a summary of the um, fairly long report that you have in front of you. Thanks, Diane. And, I've, and I think that our, you know, um, our priorities actually cover what we believe in quite well with the um, supporting inter in implementation of the integrated water strategy um, and giving effect to Te Mano o Te Wai, um, advocating for the engagement and support of the um, community water partnership and and really importantly um, and Tim you'll like this one the supporting erosion and sediment control workshops for construction industry and developers and those are things that are really key focus to to our, our city is the um, pollution of our waterways and storm waterways so I'll open it up with any questions and failing that if anyone would like to move this I'll take a move you'll move it Tim Melanie seconder <coughs> Any questions? Yanni? Yeah, I just um, a little bit concerned about them having responsibility for our integrated water strategy um, because, I mean, that's really a council document and we have had contention with the uh, CWS, as I understand it, around some of the targets around um, nitrates. Uh, um, so I just think that there's a potential there for a, a a different um, view. If certainly, um, you know, I think engaging around water is important, but that was really a document that was about this council and set up what we should be doing, not 
an external group or external groups that um, you know that that have a slightly wider regional mandate and have actually, in some instances, have different um, uh, concern or targets or levels that they find acceptable to what we may have as as a city. So, I was just quite concerned that we're delegating what we should be doing as a council. I mean, I chaired that hearing panel, and I've been pretty disappointed at the lack of um, follow up on that. You know, so. I think it's important we have oversight of it rather than delegate it. Well, I, I don't foresee this as a delegation. It's, a, it's supporting the principles in there. Is that my? Is that what you? Well, maybe staff would like to um, look yeah, at I'm the just... resolutions that we passed when we adopted the um, integrated water strategy and give advice on what's actually happened as a result of those at, from council. It does particularly highlight the objective of awareness and engagement. That's what we do um, support in supporting our initiatives. Diane, have you got a comment around that? Um, yes. Um, it isn't um, delegating any responsibilities. It's actually um, taking advantage of um, one of the resources that we have um, with us, which is um, are the, the three zone committees who are joint committees of the council, um, to help us implement the um, integrated water strategy. And as you noted, Councillor, um, Cotter, um, well, we're, public awareness and engagement is one of the key elements that flow throughout the integrated water strategy. Um, so that's in particular why that was mentioned. And um, I can't speak for the other zone committees. I don't um, engage with them very much. But certainly the Christchurch West Melton Zone Committee has been um, very much helpful um, in helping us um, implement the strategy, but it's certainly not the only thing that we're relying on to implement the integrated water strategy. I would also note that, um, again, the zone committees are committees of the council, and so we're not um, really abrogating our responsibilities in terms of implementing our own strategy. Well, that's true. That's a fair call. Right. Any other questions? Sorry, can I be clear? What's the process for monitoring the resolutions that we... Um, that we passed um, when we adopted the strategy? Um, I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but we do have a program in place to um, prepare implementation plans for the integrated water strategy. Um, and that's something that's, um, I think you're, you'll be hearing about one of those plans today, later on in the meeting today. Mm. Any further questions? Is there any debate? Um, look, I just see this as strengthening the, the team. It's a, it's a team approach. <coughs> and certainly with the Apaloho Heathcote River, you know, the, the sediment runoff has always been a concern to us. And I think that that's hopefully going to strengthen the um, toolbox that we kind of, in some respects, haven't really been using. So <coughs> I really look forward to it. And I think it's a really great move. More people taking more responsibility. It is all council, and they're all council committees. So. <coughs> Yeah, thank you very much, and please thank the Zone Committee for their um, foresight with this. Thank you. Happy to move it. All right, it's been moved and seconded. There's no more debate. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. 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 Opposed? That's carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Diane. Item 11, Burwood Landfill Operations Soil Disposal. We've got Rowan, Ross, and is it Grant? Welcome. <coughs> Um, have you, are you going to play the flyover? No. Can we? It's three minutes. And maybe you can talk um, over okay. the. Um, I just press go to it. I know. I think okay. they're going to do it up here. But if you talk over the flyover, because you can okay. tell us where the zones are and what you're um, doing there. Right. That's uh, Landfill Avenue which is heading east towards um, the landfill through Bottle Lake Forest Park. Yep, keep going. Uh, yeah, so this is the forest as, as you approach the, the landfill. Yep. Uh, okay, we're cutting to, we're entering that big hill in the background, the Green Hill is the original municipal solid waste uh, landfill. Um, the gas treatment plant's there on the right, just disappearing. Right. You can see there's a whole lot of new plantings. Those, some of those are only about a year old. Uh, this was this was taken in August, 
so it was a bit greener back then than it is now. Uh, the area to the uh, right is Site C. Um, we're going over the top of the landfill now. Um, this is heading towards the south of the landfill now. They've cut back, they're going the other way. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Site C in the foreground and right, this is this is the original landfill with, with a few new plantings and on the right is the uh, Bottle Lake Forest Park. Uh, we're coming up to the gas treatment plant again in the foreground. Oh, okay. oh, so you've done a kind of a 360. Yeah, thing. back on top of the landfill. Um, this is that was looking east. Now we're sort of going from the, to the north to the south. Look at all the, the plantings. South. It's amazing. Uh, that's that's looking out towards the coast. Yeah. There's, there's some of the new plantings that we planted. We planted over 60,000 plants in the last year, with another 30,000 planned for next year. Uh, you can see those ponds out there, they're nice little yeah. wetland features yeah. that will yeah. be there once it gets handed back to parks. Yeah. And that road will, will be a permanent access road for the rangers to get around them when it goes back to park. You can see the dunes in the, the background there with Banks Peninsula in the yeah. distance. Right. So some of the views from the top are pretty spectacular. Uh, that's one of the ponds that will be there at the end. More of the ponds. These are to the seaward side of the landfill. So have they man-made those ponds? You've made them, or Sorry? were they man-made? Have we made? Yes, them? they were. Yeah. Uh, that's more more view of the ponds area. Uh, there's still still a bit more rehab to be done on the uh, right-hand side there, which will happen this year. <laughs> Need to clean the windows, James. Another I had no idea it was so so such a big area actually. It's really good to see this. Uh, just planted by um, KB contractors for the contractors for the site. There's more and plantings up on top. You can you can see a few landfill gas wells. The little white things sticking up every now and then. There's about 37 of those at the moment extracting gas. And that's that's running out out there, isn't it? Yep, I think that's it. Yep. All right. Thank you. Probably just to note, some of those ponds, they were actually used for the hydro excavation waste that was going in there previously, so they've just been um, uh, utilised for the, the final landscaping. Right, thank you. <coughs> All right, so do you want to quickly introduce this and tell us what, uh, <coughs> what why, how? Yeah, I, I, can run, I can run you guys through. So uh, the recommendation we're putting up is really talking around the Site C, which is that small area to the west of, pardon me. Uh, so what we're suggesting is uh, continued operation of Site C, which is the small area used for silts um, and contaminated soils uh, at the facility. So basically that material is then used on the landfill for, for capping and for, for landscaping. Um, and so what we're looking at is, you know, the, the original plan, I should say, the original plan was to close all operations at the site at the end of this year, with the entire site going back to a reserve by the end of next year. And as you can see from that fly-through, we're actually quite you know, well on track with that process. What we're suggesting is keeping that small area, Site C, operational in case we have future events, but also because there are no other sites within Christchurch where low-level contaminated soils can be deposited, which means the alternatives are either a, a number of commercial operations outside of the Christchurch city limits, um, some quarries, uh, or Cape Valley landfill. So this low level contaminated soil, you know, it is not the type of material we need to be transporting up to Cape Valley. It, you know, it's recreational contact, so that's why it's been used on the landfill capping. So it's too, uh, it has contaminants at a level that you wouldn't want in your back garden but that, you know, for a recreational area um, are acceptable. And equally, you know, we could use those soils for future projects such as landfill remediation and, and other physical works. So I guess what, what we're bringing to the, to the council is, you know, a, a request to keep that operational site so that we can continue to fill the gap until the commercial sector develops such, such a facility, um, but also recognising that there's a, a revenue stream to council from operating that site. Um, and it's really, you know, a significant benefit to the contaminated land industry and to, and to residential development because otherwise the cost of disposal of that soil 
would be significant. And so, and so I guess that's the proposal to keep keep it open a little bit longer. So go for a um, revenue stream rather than a, a cost of operation by moving it. Absolutely. And can you explain where D comes into this? So site D, I believe um, we have a map in the in the proposal. Um, no. Effectively, site D no, is to the west in. of the landfill. Uh, it's in the paper itself. Sorry, the yep. map. Page um, one seventy. And so that's where the sensitive materials from the Christchurch earthquake sequence have been stored since, since the earthquakes and obviously those investigations that have gone into that work. Yep. Um, those materials are currently being removed and deposited at site B, so within the landfill footprint, right. and that's the final resting place of those materials. So that site, site D, is effectively a lay down area. So once we've removed the materials, we will clear it and remediate any contamination. And then what we're proposing in this is to retain both site C and site D for future use should we need them in, in another disaster event. So rather than return those to open space to parkland, to retain them as a, you know, as a controlled area where we could use should we have a future event. Right, thank you. All right, are there any questions? Jimmy? Okay. And uh, C, point two. The uh, five million annually uh, ongoing revenue. That's uh, whether it's from the, uh, the Trans West uh, Canterbury Limited, they put as a dividend give to us, or we just directly in council receive from the, our client or our customer. Yeah, that, that, that's completely separate from Trans West. That is the. Um, the value of the soils that are, would be deposited at that uh, well, okay. MC, well, so that's just straight revenue. Okay. Um, probably worth mentioning too, there's a, a Weybridge facility already existing and we'd look at keeping that operating over that period as well. Okay, yeah. the other ones are the, uh, the retention of sites D. If we retention just specific purpose, but a moment is with operation for the soil, you know, the disposal only in C, am I right? D yes. is a, a spare one. Yes. Yeah, in absolutely. case in the near future, there's yeah. a kind of a bigger event. You know. Yeah, exactly. And also, uh, our, our, just our, spare, our, spare. Yeah, our, our parks team you know, have, have indicated that they could use that area um, for managing the Bottle Lake Park. Yes. So. Okay, but, but this one, we don't need to apply for any uh, kind of resource concern or any uh, consenting process. No, we're just, we're just asking that the zoning for those two sites Only. be retained. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Melanie. Vignani. <coughs> um, I was just. Um, are, are they like will C and D be fenced off, or how will they like appear to the public? Like, well, currently D is fenced off completely, and yeah. C is fenced off uh, with a gate as well. So um, they will re retain those fences so that the public can't get in. Um, in site D, if uh, the parks people are storing gear there, they don't want people to come in and be able to steal them, so that'll still be locked up. Okay, cool, thanks. Yanni? Uh, thank you. Um, I just noted that this item is considered of uh, low significance. It's been assessed as low significance. In the um, seeking community views or the um, decision, we're told it affects the Coastal Burwood Community Board. So I was interested to know whether they've had the opportunity to consider this and provide a view. Um, and under 5.11, I note that you had a community liaison group set up, even though this was of low significance. But as part of that, you do say no concerns were raised and you're going to do further engagement prior to a consent. So I was just interested to know um, if the community board view had been sought um, and why, for a matter of low significance, we're holding liaison group meetings. So the, the community liaison group is for the entire Burwood recovery operations. And so that's been a long-standing COG. Um, what I guess what we're proposing here is to extend the operations of that site C. So we've we've gone to that community group and discussed it. Um, but yeah, absolutely, we could do further engagement as you know through any consenting process because we still require a consent to operate at site C. So has the community board been has their view been sought? Not the community board, no. Right. But the uh, just to, to a bit further on the um, community liaison group. Uh, it was discussed at uh, the, the last meeting and we made a commitment that we would come back to them um, right. and, and once a decision had been made if okay. we were going to retain uh, Site C for the purpose of I mean, I don't know if anyone else sees the irony in this, um, but 
Um, I just thought something like this, that it possibly should go to the community board for review, and I don't know at what stage would it would it go. Are there we... community board members on the liaison group? Do you know? I was at the liaison meeting. What's that? I went to the, li I went to the liaison meeting in uh, October, was it? Yes, yes it was. Yeah. 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 You were there. Yeah. Yeah. There's only probably 10 people there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. But generally the community board's happy with it. The community that you've engaged with it are happy with it and have no concerns. Is that correct? Sorry, you haven't heard any board. concerns yeah. about... Like the community board's OK with it? We, we haven't spoken to the community mm. board. OK. But you haven't had any concerns? But basically it's a metro <coughs> facility because it will be providing um, refuse disposal at a low... Oh, not refuse disposal, clean fill disposal at a... a um, uh, for right across the district. It's a uh, system that you run as a already at a uh, at a metro level and you've run it for the last... Okay, sorry, let me just put it another way. I think way. it would have been nice clear. if they'd gone to the, the community further, board for a heads well, up. Can you just, just tell me what you know, the further engagement board. proposed is before you seek a consent? We're going to have to get a consent, so there will be engagement throughout that consent because of the original consent. You may remember it was about... Um, I understand the main issues was about transport numbers. Sorry, what I'm trying to understand is... Sure, Prior to the consent, which I understand will go through an assessment, limited notification, public notification, it says in here there'll be future engagement. Can you just tell me what's proposed for that future engagement? That was referring to engagement back with the community liaison group. Right. We said we'd report back to them. Right. And can you also engage with the community board? I think that would be helpful. Yep. Thank you. Um, Mike? Actually, my question was very similar. To, to Yanis, and I guess it's to you as chair and, and what we do um, with further reports, because I see in this agenda we've got three items that are affecting communities, and um, and that we're not getting the view of the community board from any of them. Um, and although the decision making is sitting in the right place, um, it would be good to actually. Um, have the view of community boards before they, they come here because they represent the communities that are impacted. Um, so I just want to know what, I guess, what we're going to do moving forward to ensure this doesn't keep mm. happening. Mm. I, th I agree with you. I think we do need to have a, um, perhaps we can build a, a clause into the um, reports that uh, notes community board engagement at what level and when and how going forward. Um, and I think also. Um, Phil, you had a question regarding the road, the condition of the roading, because the, even though the number of truck movements is going to reduce. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yes, I, I was just wondering, the, the people, especially in Burwood Road, especially, um, it's been repaired off and on and it's been done well, but it's, um, it's settled in a couple of places and it's like driving along in a, like a washing board that some of the manholes are sticking up. If, if we were going to continue to do this, and a way to um, appease the neighbours that they were all thinking that it was all going to be shut at Christmas time, mm. um, that we could do some um, asphalt smoothing on there, not go mad and dig the whole thing up and go crazy, but just do that to try and... Because I, I get a number of calls about the, yeah. the banging of trucks going over the, um, over the uneven surface. Because so we've we raised an expectation that it was going to cease and now there will be a small number of trucks and you feel it would be a kind of a... a a nice thing to do uh, to, yeah. to well, improve it, it, the road. Well, I'm not quite sure when, and I should know, but I'm I, I not sure when it's due to be done, but it is one that would be good if it was, if it was part of the Can we put that in thing. resolution? Um, you could ask the transport team to have a look at where it was on the, um, on the um, we're resealing... Not, we're not talking renewal. I think you're talking... No, no just, just, again, just smoothing. Like, just yeah. smoothing. Okay, why don't we just request, request the transport team to um, investigate smoothing options for Burwood Road and report back to the, well, report back to this committee, I'd say. Thank you. To investigate road smoothing of Burwood Road and report back to the committee by the next meeting. Right, thank you. No further questions on this one? Seems sensible to me. Do we have a mover? Yeah.
didn't mean a report. How else can we word that? And give advice back. Can, can, can you just ask who it is? Yeah. Provide advice back, that's good. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's good. No, we don't want a full report. No, thank you. Right? No, I was just wondering about that. Do we have a mover for this? Phil, seconded Aaron. Is there any further discussion on this? Yani. Um, so just to bring to your attention that this is of low significance, but we are actually going to do more engagement before it gets uh, a resource consent uh, application. I certainly would endorse that. I do recall when we've done things like um, redeveloped stadiums, for example, that the more early engagement you have with the local community ahead of the resource consent process, the better outcomes that you will get. It's very hard for the community to participate in resource consent processes, A, because sometimes they're not even allowed to, it's only limited notification or non-notification, and B, it requires quite an extensive resource to put forward expert uh, advice. So, I mean, I support this decision in principle, but I do hope at some point there is an opportunity to engage with the community around their views. And I know you've gone to the liaison group, which I actually think was really good, and I would encourage that, even though this is low significance, I do think this is the sort of thing where community views should be sought. So uh, I'm happy to support it today, knowing that the staff have said that they will have a further process ahead of submitting the resource consent. Thanks, Yanni, and I agree with what you said. I'd actually quite like to put a note there, if I may. Um, no, the committee notes that staff will continue engaging with the community mm -hmm. liaison group and the local community board. Is that okay with the committee if I put that in? Yep. All right, so it's been moved and seconded. All those in favour say aye. 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 Opposed? That's carried. That brings us smoothly onto item 12, Le Bons Bay. Right. Um, Le Bons Bay closed landfill. Basically, um, Banks Peninsula District Council operated a landfill at Le Bons Bay <coughs> down by a, um, the river near the cemetery there. Um, from about 1950 through to about 1995 when it closed. Um, basically we've identified that um, there's a bit of an accelerated erosion in the area um, and there's potential for landfill material and possibly leachate to enter the stream and therefore go into uh, Le Bons Bay. Um, so th this paper is um, recommending that uh, we approve option two encapsulation and stream bank erosion protection uh, to safeguard the environment there. So what, what actually is the encapsulation um, methodology? Basically, um, it's p p clearing off um, all the major bits of junk, like there's pieces of uh, cars, there's refrigerators, there's lots of hard fill. Removing those bits from site, um, grading it, compacting it, putting a, a clay liner on, and then also, because it's right next to a, um, a stream, putting some sort of uh, protective measure to stop erosion of the bank. Um, the designs for that, what we've had TNT look at at the moment is just a scoping study, so it's, it's light on detail. Um, so we'd need, need to take it to the feasibility study next to actually firm up on the cost 100%. But you know, the types of um, protective measures could be um, you know, just uh, like we're doing at the Bexley Closed Landfill, just piling rocks and um, finer grain soils. Um, you could do gabion baskets, you could do sheet piling. There's a number of options there that we could look at, but that's for further down the track. But yeah, the, the upside of that is it would protect um, the local environment quite well. So yeah, if we go to the advantages, it reduces, eliminates most risk pathways for the lifespan of encapsulation. Um, because you're not actually digging up much of the landfill, you're not exposing the workers to any harmful products which are in the, in the landfill. And also the cost of it, which is in the order of um, 250 to 300,000 K, is uh, sort of it's a moderate cost given the size of the area. I guess the disadvantages are um, there's some upfront costs in the beginning to get consents across the line and also design. Um, plus, because you haven't removed all the material, um, there, there will be ongoing monitoring costs and potentially after storm events you might have to do a little bit of remediation. Um, 
And the other disadvantage is because of the uh, requirement to get resource consents, there's probably a six month plus delay in getting it across the line. So that's the, the preferred option. Um, shall I go through the other two? Um, yeah, I'm just, uh, Mike's got a question. I think we'll go to questions first. I think we've read the report and then Andrew. But my question to you is on 3.8 with your estimated costs. I mean, when you say you haven't even identified the detail of the preferred option, do you, are you concerned that that cost might not be very accurate? Um, How confident well, are you that given that, that it's the a cost? scoping study, it should be within the, the right ballpark, but we definitely need to do more work to okay. firm up on that. Right. And also with all the other um, options, well, the other two options as well. Okay. Mike and then Andrew. Thank you. Um, Couple, I'll keep the question short, actually. I'll just do a couple. I guess the first one. So the location of this landfill is vulnerable to the impacts of sea level rise and climate change. Yeah, it's, it's on an estuary, so it's, yeah. there's tidal influence right next to it. And so I, I guess if we chose option two, at some stage we'll end up having to do option three, which is to remove the, the landfill because of those impacts of sea level rise and climate change. Potentially. Um and that comes back to how you design that barrier to stop erosion. Yeah. Um, and also, I, I note on the in the report and the attachment that the the cost, the capital costs for the um, option two excludes um, some costings. Um, yet the the relocation um, does include costings. So actually, the the cost could get even closer than what they currently are between those two options potentially. You mean between option two and three? Yep. Uh, that, that's a possibility, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I just want to signal that I'd like to um, move option three. Seconded by Tim. All right. So that is moved and seconded. Yep. Andrew. Thank you. Um, three questions, if I can, um, two of which refer to um, paragraph 3.9.1 in the report. Um, so we refer to the lifespan of encapsulation. How long is the lifespan of encapsulation? Um, we're not clear on that at the moment. Like I said before, it's a scoping study. Um, once we get in detailed, well, next, next stage would be feasibility study and then a detailed design. So it wouldn't be until um, a detailed design. But in recommending, no, in recommending option one, um, sorry, in, in recommending this option, option two, um, option two yeah. you must have some idea of what lifespan you'd expect it to have. I mean, is it a year or 10 years or 100 years? Oh, it's 25 to 50, I'll be thinking. Okay, that's great. Um, and eliminates most risk pathways. Mm -hmm. um, what risk pathways are not eliminated? Well, uh, well basically, you, you're putting... Uh, a low permeability barrier on top, but it's not impermeable. So you're still going to get rainfall filtering through. If there's any organics in there, you get leachate generated. That leachate will filter it out into the stream nearby. Um, you know, in storm events, you get erosion, and then you get um, landfill materials exposed, and they could get washed into the stream. So it's it's not 100% effective. Okay, and then my final question. Um, Paragraph 6.3 talks about, um, let me just come to it, um, the decision does involve a significant decision in relation to ancestral land or body of water or other elements of intrinsic value, therefore this decision does specifically impact Manafenu or their culture and traditions. Um, given that we're talking about a natural stream, given that we're talking about water quality, and given that we're talking about um, engineered intervention at the stream boundary, manual intervention at the stream boundary, um, how can we be confident if they're assuming there has been no engagement with Kukurara or Runanga at this stage, how can we be confident that this option would have their support? You know, going to them to um, talk about how we implement is one thing, but making a decision on a preferred option with no Manafenua input um, seems to be quite a dangerous thing to be doing. Yeah, I, I think uh, consultation would definitely be the way to go. Should that not have occurred before we got to the point of making the decision then? What's that? It would have been good to have got Runanga um, input 
I'm into this to, being the preferred yeah, option? I'm tending to agree that this really needs to go back and have that. I would suggest process. that's a conversation that needs to be had before we can make this decision. Right. I'm, I'm tending to agree with that. Sarah? Yeah, I would agree with that if the decision was going to be option one or two. But I think that given we've had a, an indication that option three would be moved, which would be one where we were actually taking the contamination away from the land and the, and the natural environment that has got the potential to be contaminated. I think that that might be um, slightly different. So in that regard then, can I, move, can I foreshadow a further motion mm. that, so option three has been moved and seconded, that if option three does not carry, mm. that we then consult with um, Mana Whenua before we bring the matter back? Good. And then, so if, failing if we, that, can I foreshadow option <gasps> option two? Yeah. Um. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, if option three carries, there will be engagement with Mana Whenua before you you could put on you could put on any option that the option be discussed with mana Whenua and if there are concerns it comes back to you no 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 no, no. no. only option three we're happy with um, if that passes that's all right and the end before implementation there will be engagement with mana Whenua to take them along if any of the other two then we can't make a decision on those until until the engagement we've got process has been followed through. All right. Are there any other? Oh, hang on. Let's hang on. Melanie first, and then Aaron, and then Jimmy. All right, Aaron. Yeah. Um, one was just looking on the map. If we go up to option three to remove it altogether um, for sea level change, I mean climate change and sea level rise. How high above the um, water is from sea level is the rubbish dump? At, at high tide. Um, the water is lapping at the toe of the landfill. Okay, and how's that compared to the um, cemetery? How high is that? The cemetery is probably another five metres higher up. It's on sort of quite rolling, elevated ground. Oh, so it's a bit more quite a bit more elevated, five metres. It is, more. yeah. Like the cemetery's, yeah, quite a bit higher. Cool. Okay, that's just because when you're looking, just you remove that uh, on a map, they're not far apart, yeah. but you can't tell. Top of things. Me. Yeah. Thank Jimmy? you. Okay, thank you. And uh, particularly regarding to the, uh, this, this advantage between option two and option three, the, uh, regarding the financial financial cost, uh, option two and option three, which one is more high, high cost? Option three. Option three more high, one million. Is one million? Yeah. Okay, maybe more. Uh, regarding non-financial part, the uh, workers' ex exposure risk, mm -hmm. how serious? Um, well, it's, it's something that you, you, you've got to get the workforce trained up and they, they have the right procedures, wear the right uh, PPE, and it's, it's a manageable risk. Oh, so, okay, Ma like, manage your part. Yeah. It, you, you'd use similar methods that the workers at Cape Valley Landfill would use for their day-to-day -day operations. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, and? And then Yanni. Um, so, it, given that it's been there for since 1950, there's likelihood that there's asbestos in there. Yes. And is, is asbestos waterborne? Is it? Can uh, it can it still be dangerous? And if it's it's it's, taken it's a risk it? when it's dried out, it can be inhaled. The, oh, right. the best way to deal yeah. with it when you're moving it is actually to dampen it down, and then it won't blow around. Okay. And then you bury it. Okay. So that answers that one. Um, given we've just been talking about the Burwood landfill, mm -hmm. is this the kind of contamination that could go there, or does it have to go to Cape Valley? Uh, yeah, it, it has to go to Cape Valley because we, we can only accept um, soils to recreational, any use recreational levels, and this is way beyond that. Okay. You, you may be able, so obviously the cap on that landfill may be of a recreational threshold. So I mean, we could assess that as part of the detailed scope, but certainly the landfill materials would need to go to a licence to pass one landfill. Mm. Right. OK, thank you. Yanni? <coughs> Same question. Cool. Any further questions? All right, so that we have a motion on the table to approve option three, relocation of the waste to a licensed landfill. Moved by Mike, seconded by Tim. Is there any discussion? Andrew? 
I think it's clear from the report um, and the answers to the questions um, where we're at with this. Um, best practice, I would expect, would be option three, a do it once and do it well approach. Um, and you would say if money was no object, that's what we would do. Um, and I think it seems to be the right approach, particularly considering future work that might be brought around by sea level change, climate change issues as well. It's interesting on the numbers using the answers to the questions. Um, over a 50-year time period, which was the answer to the question, um, if, if you take the 350 to um, do the capital works and then you add the maintenance cost per annum, you come to a figure of around 1 million, which is close to, for a whole of life cost, the 1 million for option 3. Mm. Um, so if option 3 is only going to cost us slightly more, it solves the problem permanently, it removes the risk of further intervention because of sea level rise within the 50-year period anyway, um, and it meets environmental, ecological and I would imagine cultural values um, more closely. Um, that's certainly my reasoning for supporting option three. Thanks. Sarah, and then Liam. Thank you. Um, I think that while the information in the report is really clear on the, the potential costs um, of, of actually <coughs> doing something, the costs of inaction are potentially much higher. And I think that you only have to look at you know, the costs of cleaning up after Fox River um, to look at some of those potential costs. But also the cost to the ratepayer of having to act twice. I think that we, um, given that the, the costs aren't extraordinary, they're, they're large for a small site, but given its location, um, but they're not particularly high and the difference between the two isn't particularly strong. Mm. But we don't want to have to encapsulate it and then remove it um, at a time where um, there's much higher risk of contamination. So I think if we look at the costs of inaction, they um, uh, more than outweigh the costs of action at this point. Leanne. Leanne. Did you want to speak? Yes. Yep. Um, I um, also agree that it's um, sensible to uh, deal with it once rather than the uh, significant potential of having to go back and, and revisit the issue. But I did want to talk about the impact on mana whenua because I think these um, clauses go into these papers and nobody really takes full account of what they require us to do. Um, and when a decision does involve a significant decision in relation to ancestral land or a body of water or other elements of intrinsic value um, and therefore specifically impacts mana whenua, their culture and traditions, that, that requires action mm -hmm. and it actually requires mana whenua to be engaged in decision making prior to uh, this process. So uh, I would have expected mana whenua's views to be reflected in the paper after a statement like that. So um, that is something that I will take up with the Chief Executive um, because it has to be reminded, I think, right across the board, because this isn't the only paper, which is why I didn't want to ask questions about it, or, um, but I did want to focus on it in this, in, to the extent that this is a constant um, and it needs to change. We need to make these statements absolutely meaningful. Thank yeah, you. I agree. Sam? Yeah, thank you. I won't be supporting option three. A million dollars to remediate a small bit of land, quite frankly, is fiscally irresponsible at the moment. Um, I can accept the argument long term that there are some operating costs that drive down, um, but we could, that could be said for a lot of things across the city at the moment. We've just had basically three weeks of capital discussions. We've been cutting our cloth to a point where we're still not even at, at frankly, a, a sensible level. And then to go and blow this out by another 750000 in capital costs at the moment is, frankly, irresponsible. Um, you know, you have to balance the environment with the financial costs that are being lumped on the ratepayer, and I think the staff recommendation, which I indicated at option two would foreshadow, uh, quite frankly does that. They've got a really good balance on this uh, with some operating costs long term, um, but in the end that could be said for a lot of landfill across the city. So quite frankly I, I really hope people don't uh, drink the Kool-Aid and uh, you know, support the recommended option here or the proposed option three. Uh, we need to be far more fiscally responsible and I think you know, get a, a happy compromise of option two. So I'd urge people to not support this and back um, my foreshadow motion. Tim. Yeah, thank you. Look, I, I totally get what Sam's saying, but um, back in my mind, I look at Fox River. But if you look at Hawke's Bay, they've just had two years of drought, and then they've had a massive flood. This is right that the water's lapping, not only 
from the sea, but also it's very close to the river. Uh, the, the cost of cleaning up Fox River to the cost of actually having removed it are two different things. And so I would say, I'm, this is why I've seconded this. Get rid of it, get rid of it once. We know the cost and um, just, just bear the known cost rather than the ongoing um, and it will be significantly larger cleanup cost. Thank you. Are you wanting to close, Mike? Yeah, I'll close it. Okay. Okay, we've got three more speakers. I'm very conscious of time. Phil, Anne and Yanni. Because it's done in the 1950s, I can't ask a question. Um, the, <laughs> stuff, the stuff won't be massive. It's just people in the area going down with their trailer and biffing a bit of rubbish off. It's, mm. I'd be surprised if it's 1,000 cubic metres. I hope it's not. Um, but it'll, it'll be, most of it will be rotted. It'll be just, just, just junk. Yeah. So it won't be. It's not like a landfill where there's bulldozers and stuff going everywhere. It's just sort of probably pushed out over a period of time and bugger all there. I would say. Hmm. The so only thing I'd add to that, Phil, is oh, you I'm think. Support. Sorry. I'm supporting. Okay. Thanks for reporting. Sorry. 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 Oh, but you think the cost will be less? And the cost will be less. Yeah. We don't know until we know how big it is. And so um, I think Phil's saying that it's um, going to be a, a smaller job than perhaps what's um, envisaged, Hopefully. which yep. will mean less money. But I Are think you his interpreter. You know, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Be, you know, the the experience. <laughs> um, uh, I think that you know, if it comes down to an environment versus economy, the economy is always going to win. So let's um, really vote for long-term benefit to our environment, and also to respect our cultural, uh, those cultural um, sensitivities. Uh, that um, that deserve to be considered. Thanks, Anne. So I will be supporting option Thank three. Yanni. Yeah, um, I, I do worry about the cost of clean up if something goes wrong, which is why I would support option three, but I am concerned about the price for option three. I, I guess the one advantage is that actually most of the money that we spend on disposal will go into one either a council organisation or if it goes to Burwood, it's actually money that comes back to us. So there is a bit of an irony about that. Um, but the other thing I think we need to do is we actually need to review our significance and engagement policy. <coughs> We've now had three reports on this agenda today of low, high and medium, and the seeking community views has been different um, and almost impossible to calculate, where the ones of lowest significance have had the most community engagement, the ones of highest have had the least, and the one with um, really important with mana whenua has, has kind of after the fact. So. You know, I'd really hope that we can try and get some consistency to how we approach it, because actually we don't know the community view on which option we're being asked to decide. This is of medium significance, so I would have thought actually um, having community views first was important. Um, but also I think you know, long term actually doing it once and doing it properly to me is what seems to make most sense, given that we should actually be the beneficiary of some of that <coughs> money that's being spent for the disposal cost. Right, thank you. Before I go to Mike to close, I'll just um, add to myself that I think this actually is the fiscally responsible thing to do. Um, we do not want a disaster. We have um, had a project where we have identified a lot of these sites. We're now prioritising them in order of risk. We've begun work on Bexley. We're now doing this one. I think do it once and do it right, as has already been said. Um, and rather than leaving the problem to re-emerge later, even just bringing a report back costs a lot of money. So let's get it just put out of the way and let's not incur any reputational loss if we didn't do this right in the first place and something happens and we knew about it, that would incur considerable reputational loss. So I too will be supporting option three and I'll hand to Mike to close. Thank you. Um, if you look at both the cost ranges for the two options that we're, we're considering to scale in option one and then the ongoing operational cost, if you actually look at the um, environmental risk of, of doing option two compared to option three, you know, they both stack up to be financially and environmentally responsible. Um, and like, if this is the result of drinking Kool-Aid, hand me some more Kool-Aid because we're doing the right thing here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on that note, I'll put option three. All those in favour say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Do you want that noted? That's Sam and James. And, yeah. and <laughs> Catherine. Opposed. Thank you. All right. Um, I don't. We're not going to get this. I just want to take a bit of advice on the. 
a gin in there because we're not going to get this done by one. So we're going to be doing the meeting anyway. There's another meeting in front of the In here? We uh, yeah. What should we do, that one or that one? You're right, in fact. A bit of a sort of Move on to, we do have to move on because there is another meeting in the chamber shortly. Um, so item 13 is a receiving report. This is um, an internal <coughs> report. It's uh, not a decision-making one. So, um, Helen, would you like to introduce the what, Water Supply Implementation Plan report, please? So this is one of the implementation um, plans under the Integrated Water Strategy, and it also serves as the water supply strategy that is required for our comprehensive water take consent with Environment Canterbury. So this document has already been over to Environment Canterbury a couple of times and they've accepted as meeting the requirements of the conditions of that consent. It, um, it outlines how we will protect the water resources, particularly those that we use for community <coughs> drinking water supply, and sustainably manage those resources. It also um, outlines Council's statutory responsibilities with respect to drinking water and embraces those six principles for safe drinking water that are also in our um, water safety plans. So the implementation guide, the implementation plan generally guides project planning and it works closely with the asset management plan for uh, the drinking water supply and with our, um, our water safety plans and the improvement actions in those. Uh, I should also note that we have had feedback too from um, MKT on this plan and we've added some, some additional, um, we've, added, we've, we've reinforced some, some of the actions around the sanitary survey and looking at planning for water supply in areas where there could be um, you know, marae development. Right, that's good. Okay. Um, questions? Jimmy, then Yanni. Uh, regarding to 3.6, you know, Helen, you particularly mentioned uh, we provided to the MKT to review, but uh, not yet received feedback. My question <coughs> is will that feedback have uh, some view whether we might have a minor amendment regarding to this implementation? We have, since, since this report was signed off, we have received feedback and oh, we have really? updated it. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yes. Yanni? Check if I'm getting an answer to the question that I put in. No. Sorry. <laughs> no. Wh okay. Which question? Um, so I asked um, again ahead of the meeting um, if, like, we've got a really good, like, the implementation plan for our arts strategy, which is really good. You can see clearly who's doing what, what the objective is, what the goal is, the timing, um, the lead. Um, you don't have any a cost attached, but that would actually be an important consideration. So I was trying to get actually like a document, like a one page, easy to understand document on what the implementation plan does in terms of timing, cost, action, back to the objectives. And I couldn't find in this report anywhere that could show where it was actually happening. So um, that was the request that I'd asked for because it's quite hard to receive something when you don't actually see what the outcome is in terms of a governance level, <coughs> what we're going to be doing. So in Appendix A, we've got the, um, the options and the links across to the, the, the integrated water strategy. But I, I agree this one is quite complex because we've, um, rather than producing two documents, we've, we've integrated the implementation of the integrated water strategy with the requirements for our water supply consent. So is this what you're, you're talking about? Yes. So there's, there's nothing about timing, lead, and cost. I mean, isn't, shouldn't an implementation plan actually clearly articulate the resource required to achieve the outcome that you're going to achieve within the time frame, mm -hmm. back to the goal, the, the strategy that you're adopting? Where's the second attachment? The second attachment to it has the... 
It's the, it's the Excel spreadsheet the long that has um, all the list of projects. And should it have that. resource attached to it? Was Yanni's question? I can't see a second attachment. It's the okay, so water supply. Oh, wait a minute, page 273. Um, arts one because I thought that was actually a really good template for being able to explain to the community who made submissions here's what we're doing right and that that's why I think we need something like that for this so that we can clearly understand and articulate what the implications are so um, I'm just going through the paper version of the agenda papers and David we've got the same attachment twice instead yes, of the second yeah. attachment which is the um, which is the spreadsheet. Right, because I, yeah, I read through it quite a lot. Yeah, yeah, I beg your pardon. So we, yeah, there is a trim link in it, so we'll have to send you that separately because you guys can't, can't access the trim link. Yeah, right, that'd be good. So um, is there anything stopping you from receiving this paper today, Yanni, and perhaps you can put questions through? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the whole um, point of the integrated water strategy when we did the hearing and the resolutions was the, com the community made submissions to say to us, can you please take us on the journey? Can you explain to us what you're doing? Why keep us involved with understanding the preciousness and the value of water in our community and in our city? So, you know, I think getting that information would be really good. I think obviously if there's anything in there that we wish to go and look at, then obviously we can work that through a process. But I think just in terms of transparency, having something that's easy to read, simple English, um, people can look at it and say, right, that's what they're going to do. All right, I'll take that away. The only other question I had was, I don't, the whole issue around rainwater and grey water reuse, which came up, can you just, can you give us any sense of what work is happening in that space? That's the only very specific question I've got. So um, if you're talking about um, rainwater tanks and grey water reuse in Christchurch City and the potential to incorporate that in the district plan, is, is that the question? to be more sustainable with the water that comes from uh, the sky or that gets used through and could be Not reused. just water use, but it actually can so, ease the pain yeah. on the um, stormwater uh, system in a deluge. But yeah. yeah, what have you got? So so the, the only place we were pursuing any of that, and, and it was pursued in the district plan, is in the hill suburbs where, um, where rainwater tanks can help us with stormwater, mm. uh, and also over in Banks Peninsula where they can help us with security of supply. Yeah. There's very little being done in terms of um, grey water or any reuse of water. Mm. Yeah, I think we, we will. We may, need, we may need to talk to the policy team to see are, if they're yeah. doing any work in that area. We've, we've, Certainly, yeah. um, within three waters, we are not actively working got in that space. Through the Akara, um, a note. Um, we might be picking that up through the Akara wastewater um, hearings as well. Recommendation that it's a legislative thing from central government about the reuse of non-potable water as well. So. Um, what do you want to put a note at? What do you want it to say, Yanni? We ask for um, advice back from staff over what we're currently doing in that regard around the integrated water strategy. Um, around grey water around grey water and rainwater rain tanks. tanks. Um, and we um, have an opportunity to consider an other opportunities staff. for um, opportunities. Well, just if you give me a second, I'll find the um, point in the water strategy that it'll take. Around potential opportunities around grey water and rainwater tanks. All right. No other... Yeah. One quick one, and obviously the, um, uh, the integrated water strategy was written at a time prior to government sort of announcing a more directive uh, approach to the three waters review. So I just I just want us to be really clear that that our role is not really now to um, oppose, but just make sure that our um, communities are fully engaged and that are capable of influencing um, matters related to water, um, whatever decisions are ultimately um, made.
Yes, and uh, and this council is, as you know, working with the mayoral forum, the Canterbury mayoral forum, uh, in looking at what the options are for water services delivery that um, that ensure that the community voice is heard. Yeah, right. thank you. All right. Well, I'm happy to move this report. Do I have a seconder? Melanie, if there's no further discussion, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. 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 aye opposed, that's carried. Um, item 14. This is your report too, Helen. This is the three waters infrastructure. This is the resource recovery report. Yeah, I think I think that what we'll do is um, I'm going to carry this item over. Um, we don't have time for this item today. Next meeting. Yeah, that would be good. Are there any questions on this report? Yeah. <laughs> if Next there are meeting. any questions on this report, can people please just email them through and copy me in to the chief executive's office? Um, and we can have we can raise those questions for discussion in the next meeting. So I apologise for that. We really are out of time because the no. chamber's been booked. Um, so, as I said earlier, back going back to item um, nine, I'd like to move that um, we adjourn this meeting, and we come back. Um, we have a date for the uh, 9th of December at 4 p.m. in the chamber to complete uh, the item nine, the organics processing plant development. And that's going to give us opportunities to hold a public information session um, open to all of the public um, where staff can give an update on the technical information and explain uh, why they've um, got these options in the paper, the advantages, disadvantages and what they're perceiving the outcome will be and also to arrange time to arrange and for the community to go to a site visit to the organics processing plant prior to the 9th of December which will be really helpful. And um, also, um, it'll give time to um, have a decision on the 9th of December in time for the 18th of December close off for the procurement work. Tim? Yeah, um, can I add that, that uh, I'd like, really like a site visit with elected members as well. Um, Phil and I were talking before, and I think it'd be a really good thing yeah. for us to do and look at. The so, proposals. when staff organise that date for the site visit, could they please put the councillors on the invitation as well? Thank so, you. we will work with Living Earth. It won't be one day and one site visit. So, yep. Living Earth have said that they are happy to accommodate groups of up to five or six people Fantastic. Um, by appointment. Fantastic. So, um, that is the, the better way of doing it. Right, okay. So, Mike. Oh, Mike seconded. All those in favour of adjourning to the ninth, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Yeah, I need to do oppose that. Are you for it? I had a question. I had a question. I had a question. I'm sorry, Yanni. Just... No questions either. So, Tim got to ask a question, but I don't. Thank you. Hey, thanks, everyone. It's been. Um, Testy thank meeting so today, well, and thanks for your tolerance. And also, you know, I was that close, but um, I didn't again. want to add fuel to any fire today. So, thank you. We'll see. You.